Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Brian Shea. Yep. Daniel Tack. It's great to be here, Ben. It's so good, man. We got a great show for folks. Uh, first up, we're talking even more about Call of Duty Modern Warfare. I hope you're ready to learn more. I'm, uh, I'm super ready to learn more. Hell yeah. Well, you have it in that juicy brain. Just rub it against that mic. Let's go, baby. Okay. So we're talking about ground war, some other details, development of Modern Warfare, uh, the campaign, everything we know about the campaign, mm. fun stuff like that based on our cover story trip. Um, then we're going to talk about Evo 2019. Uh, Sergio Vasquez went. He's an expert. Uh, and we also get Andy McNamara in here to well, talk about all right. it. I'm in. Hell of a show already. Mm -hmm. But it goes on. Community emails. Uh, we have a ton of great questions. People send them to podcastinginformer.com. We'll answer those in a hilarious fashion. Then back after the show, I'm also excited about this. It just keeps getting better and better. We have Matt Booty from Microsoft, who is the head of Xbox Studios. Hmm, it's a name nice. you've heard more and more in the industry. You've probably snickered at you've more and more in the it. industry. There's meme magic behind that name. Uh-huh. So Mr. Booty, uh, he talks all about his history in the game industry. Uh, also, just what Microsoft's going for with buying studios. I feel like so many times in this podcast, we've talked about what does that mean? What studios are they going for? Why would they buy Double Fine? Why did they buy Ninja Theory? What does it mean for Ninja Theory's other projects that were in the works other than Bleeding Edge, stuff like that? So we talk all about that. Uh, some interesting discussion about Double Fine and what he sees as the future of Double Fine games. Um, we get his reaction to seeing a lot of Halo Infinite, which is interesting and unexpected. Uh, you know, I bug him about Perfect Dark, the natural amount. Um, and then also a fun cameo at the end of the interview from the PR person who lined up the interview. Uh, Jim Riley, hey. Hey. news editor, he used to be on this podcast for Christ's yeah, sake. What a right. show! And so it's it a sounds like a real big show. It's a banger, <laughs> as everyone says. A uh, couple things off the bat: um, Outer Worlds. Joe Juba got to play uh, a fair bit of Outer Worlds from Obsidian, even a bit more. Actually, we also talk about Outer Worlds in that uh, Matt Booty interview. The Outer Worlds. The Outer Worlds. So Joe Juba got to play more of the Outer Worlds. Um, we recorded a new Gameplay Today video. You can find that. Joe unloads all of his new thoughts on that. Um, let's see. Also, Game Club. That's right. For it's Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, the original game from 2007. So the way this works is we ask the community to play through that original game again, Call of Duty 4, and then send specific things into podcast at GameFormer.com. Say, on this level, there was this one texture that was broken, or this always reminded me of this, or what is the deal, or what I appreciate about this moment is that it does this in an interesting way. Get specific with those emails, podcastinginformer.com, because on next week's show, back after the show, we're going to be diving in deep and talking about that, ga uh, that game's full campaign, and also a little bit about multiplayer, if you're so inclined. Uh, Brian Shea is going to be there. I am. Have you started it yet? I have. What do you think so far? I'll save it for next week. Hot damn. Everybody, please save it for next week. But also at the same point, um, be sure to email in before that episode because we record on Wednesdays. And so email in sometime early next week. Yeah, just uh, just to, have to your be clear, included. since I've actually seen some questions floating around there on the internet, yes, they're, sir. they're playing the entire game and then sending, right? Yes, that's, that's right. So it's a shorter that. campaign, mm -hmm. so we're just doing it mm -hmm. in one big chunk, right? right. Um, Seven welcome. hours, according to howlongtobeat.com. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I always had it as five in my that mind. That is the DS version. The I looked it up last night. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right. This is longer than I expected. Ooh, mm, what a commitment. Well, let's do it. Um, okay, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. We went out to Infinity Ward. Uh, we talked about multiplayer uh, last week. Everything we're excited about there. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, we saved one multiplayer mode to talk about, which is yeah. Ground War, which mm. was at the multiplayer event. We got to play on a different map. Uh, the code name was Downtown for this map. It's kind of like an Eastern European map. It's a great name for it since it is Downtown. It is, in fact, Downtown. Uh, Dan, what is Ground War? Oh, boy. So... You know, I'm not a Battlefield guy, but I'm told this is very similar to a Battlefield mode. This is a, it's a five cap domination, essentially, a giant, on a giant scale. Yeah. Where you can, uh, you can spawn into any of your controlled areas. So spawn points can be any of those capped zones you have, or even player controlled APCs that are driving across the map while you jump into them. So basically it's just like a big domination match if you want to think about it in those terms. We played 32 versus 32. Uh, we've heard that the mode will go much higher. They say 60 plus. Uh, we'll see. I think outside of outside of what they told us, other sites have confirmed 100. I'm not sure if that's true wow, or not. Wow, really? I, I just heard it secondhand. So. Okay. But, but I'm saying, like, it's a big mode with lots of people in it. And it's interesting. They even compared it to earlier Battlefield games, which is very fun. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's no squads. No uh, squads. Which is a growing mechanic. And, so and that's no, like, earlier right. Aspects. So no, like, weird... Uh, classes or anything. You can't play like a support medic or anything like that. Anything you take in is from your own loadouts from multiplayer. So all that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, the applications are different. 
because it's a large scale battle. So you're going to want to take stuff like smoke grenades and other stuff you might not bring into, you know, your typical team deathmatch where you're just trying to kill people. Yeah. Uh, since it is objective based and there's lots of wide open road where you definitely want to use that smoke to obscure your movement toward like big points like the bank or this one point that's like locked between two skyscrapers and you can't see in there. Yeah. Uh, lots of stuff like that. It's it's big. It's huge. The map is gigantic. Mm-hmm. It's so strange to me that the messaging around this mode was like, oh, we wanted to take a lot of like kind of that zeitgeist of battle royales and turn it into a Call of Duty mode. That's the way they framed it repeatedly. And is that confusing? Really? I don't, I don't recall yeah, that. They absolutely did. When talking about like, okay, clearing the space, a lot of designers are like, okay, we got to run from this to this. There's no mm-hmm. cover there. And it's like, well, have you played Battle Royales? That's how it works, and right? There, and there are lots of cover spaces, but but that whole open road thing, that was uh, that's a way different from a standard map. Like, you walk out in that middle of the road, you're dead. You're right. just going to die. You got to think about the cars on the side. A lot of people maybe. on rooftops. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's interesting mode. It's just that weird no man's land in my mind of like, a little bit more like Battlefield, has some elements that feel like a Battle Royale, but it's not a Battle Royale. Like, who is this for well, within the, the Call of Duty audience here? I think what they're really going for is just, just create the, you know how at Battle Royales have those stories you tell. Right. This, this mode seems really designed to take advantage of that. Like, even in just the games we played, it's we less had... less structured. We had, like, a yeah. giant bank assault, and, like, you know, I, I saw that happen, but it was always, it was in the distance. Like, I saw, like five guys trying to defend against a juggernaut at the bank. And that was, you know, that, that those kind of moments are going to happen all the time. And they're like, yeah. well, remember when I got the juggernaut and just took the game? Mm-hmm. And that's fun stuff, you know? Uh, while I was skirmishing behind some buildings yeah, with uh, the snapshot grenade. Yeah, absolutely. And there are, you know, a fair amount of vehicles going around. It's, there are, you know, t- there are, I didn't get in one, but the choppers are also player controlled. Yep. I yep. saw mm-hmm. one and I was like, uh, maybe I shouldn't grab that. I'll just, I got to go back to the point. I did just to find <laughs> out that it does control, thank God, the same way as like Blackout Chapters, I choppers, think that stuff like that. I saw a chopper just get blown to pieces and it was amazing. Nice. I, I bet that's the norm. And yeah. Yeah, the map size and scale is just an enormous. And there's so many people, like, it does feel, again, you know, people always say Call of Duty is the same. This is very different, much like the night mode and realism mode we played. I, I don't recall ever having this experience in a mm-hmm. Call of Duty game ever. Yeah. They're ha- they've had things labeled Ground War before, but they were much smaller scale. Yes. Uh, and the odd bit is I love Blackout last year from Black Ops 4. You and asking, me both. Yes, thank you. Uh, asking about Battle Royale this time around, it's an odd message. Because even don't think at the it multi- was odd at all. Well, the, the multiplayer <laughs> event is very much, we're focusing on core multiplayer. Uh huh. Even this, though, it's like, well, clearly they have the tech for this. It seems so close. And in the rapid fire with Joel Emsley, the studio mm-hmm. art director, you can see his reaction when I ask <laughs> about a battle royale, and it's, ah, uh, we're not, we're we're focused on this right now. Well, it's, which, if, by the way, that was very good video, Ben. Oh, did you watch it? I did. Thank you. What stood out from watching the edited version? Oh man. I mean, I'm sorry. These these are barely edited at all. But what stood out <laughs> watching that the edited version? I uh, I really like the way that you edited down the responses to be so snappy. Uh-huh. Very good. I, we've never done that before. Interesting. <laughs> Anyways. See, I mean, if they were working on one, they certainly have the structure in place now with all the testing they've done in this, another another mode that has tons and tons of people all doing the same, all kinds of crazy stuff. Yes, absolutely. I want them to be working on one. They weren't confirming one, but there's a little, little, uh, little <clears throat> zest in their step when, when asked about <laughs> a battle royale. Is that if, a phrase? If, if no. There, if there's there, a little bit of like, ah. If there is one, they're not ready to talk about it now. I pray to God there is one. I really hope really? there is one, Dan. Absolutely. Rather than continuing support for Blackout? Look, that's Treyarch. They can keep I, 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 That's Raven. This, I mean, is a, this, is a, this is a conundrum that we dealt with at the point. We were like, what happens when the next annual release comes out? Yeah. What if they have a battle royale? I know. I mean, at some point... Also, they have the mobile version, which is also Call of Duty Battle Royale. At some point, you gotta, you got to say, maybe we should just have a Battle Royale game, Call of Duty Battle Royale. And maybe that's what this is going to be. Maybe studios. this is going to be bundled with it, and that'll be the new default, and they'll stop supporting Black Ops. Because it is a crazy idea to, in theory, within two years, launch three Battle Royale Call of Duty well, when games. Well, when you got three studios making games, you know, right. you, can, you can push. But that's what I was confused about, is even asking them in that rapid fire, like, who's supporting the studio right now? Because I was expecting them to say Raven, since Raven had so much experience working on Blackout. Well, they, 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 they did pull, not cite Raven. They pull from that whole pool of the... Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to call them secondary, because they're just as important in, in the development of these games mm-hmm. as, as the main teams. But, you know, they come up in every conversation. It's like, oh, who's supporting this? Oh, you got the, the list. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Brian Shea, would you make a bet that Modern Warfare has a, camp, or a battle royale at some point? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Safe bet. I'm a just. Very, I'm, very, I'm, uh, I think there will be one 
I just don't know if it's going to be bundled in, like you said, or right. a part of actual Modern Warfare proper. There's the question. Uh, let's see. No zombies mode. No uh, zombies. They say, hey, Modern Warfare's never had zombies. We're not going to do that. Not a thing. We have spec ops for the for the multiplayer co-op we, they, aspect. They didn't tell us a lot about that. But no. We, what we were able to discern is that it uh, it continues after the campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be basically the fleshed out multiplayer co-op experience. Right. I'm excited for that. I like Yeah, those. it should be fun. Uh, four player squads. Um, that's also like the downtown map we played for Ground War that is also a Spec Ops location apparently. Mm. Um, there's going to be vehicles in Spec Ops yeah. so we have like a couple of rough details And, and again, we, we talked about it a little last week but the vehicular focus is, is super cool. And yeah. With anti-vehicle weapons and all kinds of other things like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, the game's campaign. We got Ooh. to see three missions um, kind of jumping around from the campaign overall. Mm -hmm. It was the same stuff that I think talked about at E3, maybe there a little was, bit more. There was the stuff that was at E3 Dredges Week, and there was the stuff at E3. And we yes. got to see both and then sort of talk to the two lead Taylor campaign. and Jacob. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Which is very helpful to get to talk to them Absolutely. about exactly what they have in mind for this. Uh, Brian Shea, uh, what was your take on that campaign? Uh, it looks intense. Intense is a good word. Yeah, so uh, their whole thing is like you have to go from place to place completing these missions, but all along the way, you're going to have to identify who the threats are. And like like the whole thing is like the the rules of war have changed. So mm -hmm. it's like there's no like your enemy may not be wearing a uniform. So you have to kind of keep your your head on a swivel and like seeing who is not a threat and who is a threat and if you accidentally like kill somebody who is a th or who is not a threat you're basically like just given a game over screen it's a, it's a fail state well they, they said that it would take multi you know they hinted that it would take multiple incidents of you know you wouldn't be court martialed or, you can't run and gun your way through this game sure and it, well at least the missions we saw correct yeah. let's be very clear on that yeah. um because the, the one mission we saw again didn't look like anything any call of duty mission that i've ever done this is um, piccadilly piccadilly the, or the hometown, the townhouse, no, no, uh, townhouse. So it's called townhouse. It's a, it's an incursion mission, a nighttime assault onto a, on a terrorist safe, uh, safe house, and uh, it was very tactical. You know, shooting through walls, identifying threats, zip ties on the on non combatants to get them out of there. Mm -hmm. It was much more of a, I don't know, like a Rainbow Six style like uh, tactical incursion than a than a Call of Duty. Hide behind cover, gun, run. Hide behind cover, gun, run. Go mm -hmm. down the corridors. You know what I mean? Yeah. There, there is. There, they have done stuff like that in the past, but not to this level. Right. That's exactly right. Now, so it was enough, enough different to say that, like, yeah, they've played around with concepts like that, but it was. Yeah. It wasn't. It was. I intense, mean, certainly. I mean, there's like people sitting at the table. Yeah. Arms like in the air. Shoot them in the face. They're a threat. You got to move on. There's women in the house. There's babies crying. There's a baby. Shoot them. Yeah. Move on. Not the baby necessarily. You the, don't the shoot woman the baby. Who goes for a weapon. Stuff like that. It's pretend hostages. Yeah, like the, yeah, like yeah. the woman like talks to the guys like take me hostage and like you walk in the room and the guy's holding the woman like a human shield and you kill the guy that's holding her and she like falls to the ground. You're like okay, that's it. And then no, she runs for a shotgun. You're like oh great, great. Right. I got to take her out now. Yeah, it's and it's. Intense is a good word for it. Extremely grisly. Un I would call it the unflinching eye of a combat scenario in that mm. situation. I got to the point uh, where I was like, I don't know if I'm excited to play this campaign. Wow. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a sensitive uh, wimp when it comes to, to gore and game stuff like that, and I realized, like, this is beyond my level. Like, I'm not going to play this. Did, uh, doesn't did, that, like, sort of entice you? Because games don't normally evoke that kind of emotion. At least not yeah, for me. Yeah, absolutely, but it's still it's not an experience I want to go through. How did you handle No Russian? I haven't played Modern Warfare 2. What? Mm -mm. Is it because of that? Like, you heard no. about this and... No. no. Let's talk about it in the game club for the original Modern Warfare. Yeah, that's a good... Next week, podcastinginformer.com. Um, so it's like the entire idea is that there's a terrorist attack, Piccadilly, in London, and the, you found out that it was planned in this house. So you're going into the house, mm -hmm. and it's like, the part that I love is they put a date on the screen, and it's October 20th, 2019. Like, they're trying to make this as modern, modern. as you can be for a Modern Warfare game. Like, literally... Maybe the day that you're playing the game <laughs> will be uh, on the screen there. I mean, yeah, that's something that cons consistently reinforced among the the demos we did see. It, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would call it like, you know, some people are going to take the approach that like they're just trying to be edgy and trying to, you know, get people talking about it because it is so out there. But it's like, sometimes I, I think sitting here in the Game Informer office, we, we, we take a lot for granted in... in in terms of like what happens in, in scenarios like this. And mm -hmm. it's as close as to, as possibly replicating a situation that a real team might go into in that situation. Yeah. And I think there's, 
a reason they're not showing that footage i do think there mm. would be a public outcry i well, do i don't know if i expect it to be another no russian level but i think when people start to see these missions from the game i could sure. see public at large being like whoa 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 wait a minute no, what are you doing well, I, I asked games? them that i was like are you going to show this and yeah they're like we want the context when right people, when the because, public sees this because you know it was a good point that taylor and jacob emphasized over and over again is like we're showing some real intense moments from the campaign here. Don't expect the entire campaign to be like this. There's going to be levity. I mean, you've played, you know, Infinite Warfare's campaign. There are some Great more campaign. human notes. Yeah, exactly. Um, but there's some more human notes and levity in between these very intense, uh, I would say, effed up sequences, right? Mm -hmm. And they just want to lead with this to show how different the campaign is this time around. Yeah, they're, they're genuinely horrifying. Like, yeah. And, and again, for me, I don't necessarily consider that a bad thing because I like to feel something when I play a game. If that's, if that's, if that coincides with the story they're trying to tell. Uh, yeah. It, there is, there's always the risk of saying, well, if they're just getting gratuitous to be edgy and, and, and controversial and all that. But I think the team is in a position that can handle it with as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Stuff like this with some grace. I, I love. I love the idea that Activision's funding it. That they are taking a big yeah. swing like this. I just think. I think the feedback could be intense. I think it will be. Yeah. Right. There's no way it's not. It, mm -hmm. Those were extremely graphic. Extreme. Yeah. Yeah. They. They are brutal. Some people won't be able to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a whole feature like what you can expect from the Call of Duty Modern Warfare campaign that you can find on GameInformer.com tomorrow. Mm. Uh, but I have this quote from Joel, the art director, who was like. You know, like, I, I've seen the end of the game, and it's unbelievable, but, like, it could have really gone bad if it wasn't handled with the care that these mm -hmm. guys did. And I think that, like, normally, I think people would be like, oh, Call of Duty can't say anything meaningful. But, like, the fact that they do have these these uh, Naughty Dog devs helping out with the, the narrative or actually leading the narrative, I yeah. think that gives it a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of credibility there. It is a sweet thing to see, like, especially... There's a confusing saga behind the development of this game, right? Where it's... Uh, so three leads in particular. Uh, we have Joel, the studio art director. Mm -hmm. Jeff Smith. Jeff Smith, who's the multiplayer design lead. Also, uh, he worked on Junkyard Wars, one of the best TV shows of all time. There you go. Uh, it was very exciting. And Mark Rigsby, the animation lead. They were at Infinity Ward for the early days, Call of Duty 2, up to Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare 2. They then left and formed Respawn mm -hmm. with those folks over there, Vince Ampella, Jason West. Then uh, after Titanfall 2, they came back to Infinity Ward. And so it's this weird thing where while they were gone, Infinity Ward was bubbling, was churning, eventually hired Taylor and Jacob away from Naughty Dog. And they've kind of put a new spin on what Infinity Ward's take on Call of Duty campaigns are. And so it was the most interesting part of the trip was just seeing like these former Respawn developers coming back to Infinity Ward and you definitely had the impression that they're like, holy God, like this studio is taking campaigns so much more seriously than we were. Like they obviously love Call of Duty 4's campaign, but they're like, look, that story was what it was. But like, hey, this is like a, you guys are doing like a real story this time around. <laughs> like what is going on here? You're going for emotions, deep emotions. Uh, they showed us the the Kleenex room as they, as they called it. Ah, uh, yes. That's uh they actually test the, the campaign with different people and they have them play it in there and they, and they watch them to sort of see what kind of uh, emotional response they have. I've heard the Kleenex room mentioned in other studios, but the explanation that I always heard from other studios about why it's called the Kleenex room is because it's just a quick test, like a one and done, like a Kleenex blur, right. nose, move on, right? But they put a spin on it this time around it's in the nice Kleenex spin. room. Yeah, Joel said the story made him cry. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of cryptic hints. I, I bet it's going to make me cry too. Really? I mean, I, I shed a tear at the end of... Uh, Infinite Warfare's campaign. So. That's wow, Dan. I knew Infinite I was, Warfare was a very good. I campaign. knew I was being manipulated to do so. Okay, yeah. But I, but I still, uh, you know, it's like I said. I think that is one of the best Call of Duty campaigns I've ever played, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited to see Jacob and, and Taylor sort of like go, just go like hard, go yeah. hard on this one. Seems like they really have the green light on this one. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, Taylor in particular, he said, "Hey, you should leave this game with a different worldview than you entered this game." But it's not political. Yeah. But <laughs> you can understand they keep, that. They kept saying they wanted to. Side. They wanted to inspire empathy or like give give players a, a sense of empathy, even if they're not really looking to get like a message from the game. Like even people who are just like, yeah, this game's fun. I want to go and shoot some stuff. But like they're kind of like trying to give players that sense of like, all right, I don't agree with this person, but I understand where they're coming There's from. There's no and, such and thing think, as good guys and bad guys. And a game like this it. is in such a precarious position because on one hand, you have zany multiplayer action where it's just fun, right? Your white phosphorus is a <laughs> you gotta, kill you gotta, streak. You get a Tamagunchi. Yeah. You're just shooting people, and, and it's, it's out of that context. It's, or it's removed from 
the single player experience, which is much more heavy and mm -hmm. maybe you're thinking about what you're shooting at. Uh, you should be. Yeah. And these are very dissonant chords and they're together in the same package and it's a, mm -hmm. it's a weird thing and it's, I, I would imagine, almost impossible to sort of balance these things. These are, these are two very different experiences and one of them, uh, you know, in discussion, one of them is always going to get lumped in with the other. Like, can Call of Duty be taken, you know, is this, are they taking these these issues of war seriously while at the same time giving you a Tamagunchi to hatch and evolve and poop? Okay, well, you know, it's, it's, it's little, not going to poop. But. Do you think it's a little bit of that split of, uh, I mean, this is oversimplification, I'm saying, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying it's an interesting split between the respawn guys coming back to Infinity War, like, we want to kick some ass, here we go, uh, Call of Duty multiplayer is awesome, let's go, let's give it our all, versus the Infinity Ward bubble that's been brewing up with the Naughty Dog developers. I, I don't want to think take a more think, grounded approach. I think it's a situation that Call of Duty's always had to deal with, but now it has to deal with it even more. Because, mm -hmm. Yeah, but now because, it's wanting to say something, like, important. Do, I, I mean, we don't know that for sure. We don't know. They're do, trying we, to we say We do something. know that they're attempting to handle extremely sensitive and extreme topics with a deft hand. It's, it's the closest I've ever heard a cover story pitch come to our old cover story trip for Rainbow Six Patriots. Which is strange about yeah you, you wouldn't know. stop talking about that. <laughs> I think it's an interesting comparison overall. I think there's a lot of Rainbow Six in here. Going back to like the dissonant chords that Tack was talking about, it reminds me of Spec Ops: The Line. Yeah, where it was like, all right, it, we're gonna say something really, really heavy here, and it's like, oh, only eight more headshots until you get this achievement. Mm -hmm. But I still think Spec Ops is probably the best example of a video mm -hmm. game handling that. Like, yeah, oh. I think they did a good job. It's a very good one so far. I mean, this one has some serious potential there. We'll see. Yeah, we'll definitely see. So, you know, outside of the opening mission and stuff like that, uh, you're going to be playing half the game as Kyle and the other half as Alex, who's a CIA, CIA operator who's going to be in the Middle East. Roughly working. half. I'm sure there's some missions where you're going to be like, yes, we, we saw a mission where you play as child Farah. So. Right. And that's about three fourths of the way through the game. There's this character named Farah. You get to see where she comes from growing up, uh, watching her father die along with uh, and her mother. Yes. And, and oh my God, that's uh, that that opening s scene of that mission was gut wrenching. The other mission, you know, the 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 townhouse against the terrorists is one thing. This mission is going to disturb people because you're going to know Farah in the campaigns. Yeah. Three fourths of the way through at this point, you know, she's like, okay, she's strong and fearless, and she has a developed sense of what's right and wrong is the way you're describing her. And then you get to see where that all came from, where the Russians invaded her Middle Eastern presented town. Presented as a um. As a flashback. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you play as her, so you actually have the agency of this child that can be killed and it's in a, many horrible ways. Yeah. And it's a little bit like, you know, left behind to tie back to the Naughty Dog thing, uh, or even a little bit like, you know, the reboot of Tomb Raider, where it's like the big deal about young Farrah getting her first kill and it, it being as brutal as possible, right? Mm -hmm. it, was not, it was not pleasant. Not pleasant at and all. And also the, the things happening around her. Good Lord. Uh, the, and, then, and they're very graphic. And again, like... A lot. It's if you are disturbed by both humans and animals and the sounds of them dying. It's a lot of gurgling and, and writhing in pain as you're like this little girl crawling through this war zone, trying to survive, trying to escape, trying and, to get somewhere. And at the same, you know, I'm not condemning this. It's, yeah, it's an experience that you opt in for, and, That's and, true. and I don't think everyone's gonna. Like I said, I don't think everyone's gonna be able to handle it. Yeah, like if you're the normal like Call of Duty, I like to play multiplayer and hop in a party with my friends and shoot some people. And you're like, maybe I'll try campaign this year. Mm -hmm. uh, just expect a different experience from the multiplayer in I this think, campaign. I, I think, think there's going to be a certain percentage of the community that's gonna try and play this like some old Call of Duty campaigns and be very frustrated with the amount of fail states right. and like just the speed of some of these things. Like what I'm playing yeah. is like a little girl crawling through and making cell phone calls to distract people. Like this is a weird Call of Duty rhythm. Call of Duty campaigns, like say Advanced Warfare. They always get yeah. compared to like Michael Bay explosive yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't see that here. There's going to be a lot of like probably explosions, but not in the same way. Yeah. yeah it's, not in a fun way. They, it's not like <laughs> hell yeah, explosions. Yeah, because yeah, I talked about how, I remember on the Last of Us cover story, how much uh, Neil and Bruce back then said that they were inspired by No Country for Old Men. That was the tone they wanted for The Last of Us overall. Mm. And so uh, because Taylor and Jacob worked on that, they said, oh, yeah, this time around, not plot-wise, but tone-wise, Sicario is our North Star. Like, mm -hmm. that's the tone that we want for this game's campaign. But also some hints of American Sniper in there, yep. stuff like mm -hmm. that. And, and I want to say, although, I did, although the content was extremely graphic, extreme, and disturbing, you know, I don't consider that to be necessarily a, fair, a bad thing. The, the emotional response is a rare occasion for me in games. So when I get it, it doesn't have to be a happy one, right? Yeah. As, but, but to be able to use the medium to draw out emotion of people, I think is, is very skill, skillful. Yeah. That's my opinion. But we'll see if that plays out in 
we need to see the whole greater picture, right? Right. 100%. And yeah. I'm expecting there's going to be, you can be playing as Farah in other areas. Mm-hmm. Like we asked if this is the only time you play as Farah, and I think their exact answer there's was... There's no way. Well, the, their answer was, at that age, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I'd imagine one of these, if it's Alex or Kyle, is going to go down, and then you'll take a... I, you know, I would Farrah imagine. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, yeah, we asked, like, do you play as modern-day Farah or Farah? And they were like... Uh, we don't know yet. Or uh, like, because we're not saying. Because it's a Call of Duty from different perspectives, I think even though it's, you know, they, they put it in those broad 50-50 buckets, I'm pretty sure we're going to play as other characters too across right, the course yeah. of it. Yeah, uh, I think her brother's going to be a component. We don't exactly yeah. know how, but he's think growing bro- up as well. I think the brother takes the different, uh, you know, I here's so my my, uh, my take on what we heard. We yeah. weren't not explicitly given this information, but my take is that Hadir kind of goes the other way instead of becoming the good guy, the good guy, instead of becoming a moral compass, Mm. Um, well, he, the, he decides yeah. to and justifies the means to get the to take probably revenge against the people who killed his father. And right, against the Russian invaders. Yeah, yeah, and is more of the insurgent type. I think that's, that's likely where it's going to go. Right. Yeah. 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 Hey. Anyways, uh, interesting campaign. Um, Very. I was struck by the tone of this cover story trip in general, and this is pretty inside baseball overall. But Call of Duty, one of the biggest series in the world. We've done. God, I've done four Call of Duty cover stories at this point. Five? I forget. Um, but it's always like a pretty intense thing and a pretty structured thing. This was the most casual trip in general. I don't know if it's just a matter of faith. The franchise is so big. We've worked with Activision enough. But I was shocked just how the former Respawn crew in particular, it's like they were so loose, just referencing a ton of EA games, referencing other games left and right. Everything was cool, right? It was just, it felt so much more casual. And I don't know if that's it just... It felt more comfortable. I wouldn't say casual. Okay. They, they were letting their hair down a little bit. Yeah. Which, which, which was unusual. It yeah. was really, really nice. And I don't know how much of that is just that crew coming back, having traversed the industry now and came back to Infinity Ward. But there's definitely an aspect like Joel, the studio art director. Uh, we interviewed him back on the cover story trip for Titanfall. And he was big like on making the maquettes of like the actual physical Titans, which was awesome to see. He still had those in his office mm. now it's like oh in an activision office it's awesome to see all these titanfall figures but of course and now he's taking that same approach and he has a bunch of mannequin heads and oh, it's, it's like oh, painting it's really cool paint. it's fascinating to see that stuff yeah. it's like oh there's that guy's coat i'm working on it you know i went out into the field and, and tore some holes in it and or something beyond that speaking of which uh the ghillie suit from all ghillied up oh, yeah. in modern yeah. warfare one it's coming back <laughs> It is literally Modern Warfare 2019. They literally went because they had that in the basement somewhere, and they rescanned the original ghillie suit for mm-hmm. a mission or for just for a texture overall for the new Modern Warfare. I mean, there's there is almost zero chance that there's not a ghillie mission at night, right? And like some, yeah. yeah there's no way. Like, yeah, can see what we saw. Even though they're not going for as they put it a greatest hits approach with the original Modern Warfare, I'm right. sure they're gonna. It's some things are gonna be thematically tied in some way, right? Even like, you know, parts about that mission in the townhouse remind me a little bit of like the ship. Uh, uh, very, sequence for the very opening. little but just tone wise like you're following them they're on a mission they're very tactical mm-hmm. they know exactly what they're doing right it's it's at night stuff like that mm-hmm. um but yeah but it just it was so fun to see joel he just seemed to be jazzed about like the budget the technology like coming back to infinity ward it's like wait what have you guys been doing what can we do now <laughs> what is the tech we have here that I didn't quite have it respawn like it's it's very fun to see this new wave of energy for those folks that left also it's fun to see this is very insider as well but just like the gaps in their knowledge like we talk about you know, uh, their philosophy towards cheating and multiplayer or make some references to the last couple Call of Duty games and, like, the people who've been at Respawn are like, ah, uh, we're not as familiar with the last couple Call of Duty games as some other people in the studio. It's just fun to be, to constantly dance around, like, well, yeah, that reminded me of that last game that I worked on from another franchise, but Call of Duty this time. Like, they always had a fun way of expressing, like, uh, you know, the Titanfall era, which they love, and they, like, mm-hmm. also just, they were openly talking about how brilliant they thought Apex Legends was. Yeah, that's like they didn't the work. word that Joel actually used, yeah. was, I thought Apex was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely, and, like, they didn't work on that, but it's like, oh, we, we're amazed they pulled it off. It looks incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, other things stood out to you guys about the trip in general? Well, there's a whole lot more information at GameInformer.com all month long. That's true. Uh, Shay, what do we got coming up? Uh, we've got a dive on the campaign tomorrow, like I said. Uh, we'll have talks about... Uh, multiplayer customization and also a discussion with all those uh, respawn developers who came back to infinity ward about why they did it and uh studio co-head patrick kelly sat in on the talk as well yeah. and gave his perspective on how the team's coalescing and all that all that good stuff and you don't want to miss that one that one is it's some good genuinely stuff. and it's not like shay knocked it out of the park question wise you did a wow. good job 
Man, no, I like cut that? <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying, it's generally one of the most fascinating interviews I've ever heard, though. Just like the topic, like that, I love color day development. I love being there and seeing Respawn early on and just hearing them communicating about what it was like coming back to the studio at the, just the idea of that classic Infinity Ward Respawn saga moving on and this is the stage of the story at this mm -hmm. point is then some people come back to Infinity Ward. Like they were so candid and it was so fascinating to hear their take on what that actually feels like to, to leave a startup like Respawn. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because, you know, you have the guys who worked on Call of Duty, like old school Call of Duty, leave and go to Respawn. You have the Naughty Dog guys coming over to Infinity Ward. Yeah. And then you have Zed, the studio director, uh, who was old school Call of Duty, left to go to Respawn, mm -hmm. then left Respawn to go to Naughty Dog, uh -huh. and then came back to Infinity Ward. So he's gone like all those different roads with all those guys. Yeah, it, we cannot overstate how incestuous Southern California game development is. <laughs> Everybody is everywhere. But it's also fun talking about, you know, with them just about that level of rivalry that they had with Naughty Dog back in the day. And like, it's like a mutual respect thing, but that is just carried forth. It's a fascinating saga. It turns mm -hmm. out the development of Call of Duty games continues to be Incredibly fascinating, Dan Tech. And a massive it undertaking. It is. There it is. Gameformer.com slash Modern Warfare, everybody. Uh, for now, uh, you guys want to clap on out of here? Yep. Oh, Serial Vasquez. Hello. Wearing a hat for the first time in your life. What? Is that correct? A what? A hat? A, a what? A cap? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what? Is it covering your I thought, ear holes? I, I don't know. I thought he was playing you there for a second. <laughs> I thought that too. And that's the voice of Andy McNamara, editor-in-chief and uh, fighting game extraordinaire, I believe. Yeah, that, not for a long time. There used to be a time when I would, when I was pretty good, but not, not, not now. But you still love watching fighting games. I love watching. Evo is one of my favorite weekends of the year. Really? For esports, yes. What's the appeal? And Serial, I know you're there and you know a lot of stuff, but we'll get to you in a second, <laughs> buddy. Don't answer this question. Yeah, cool it, head boy. <laughs> Uh, let's ask the guy who's not the expert. Um, uh, the, uh, I mean, it's, I, I think it's just good competition. I think it's fun to watch. I think it's, uh, it's, I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't been to one. I'd love to go someday, but you kind of get the, you know, you, you get down, it's the, it's the final eight kind of generally in a bracket. They're all really good. It's, it's fun to watch the competition, kind of watch the meta a bit, a get a bit that they're doing. I think. Evo has some some great people that work as far as like the commentary around like and explaining the fights as they go along. I mean, they, they do a really good job, I think. Mm -hmm. Like I those those two guys who announced Tekken, like they're amazing. Like they're so good. And like I, you know, I didn't even know that I'd love Tekken this year. And I ended up really enjoying the Tekken segment. And what it seems to be the takeaway the last couple of years is like, hey, Tekken is a lot more fun to watch. It's probably a better game than the industry is giving credit for. Yeah, it's it's slowly. It, it's one of the few games that's actually gained more entrance at Evo every year. Really, versus a lot of games with like Street Fighter Five and, and Dragon Ball, which fall off slowly year over year. Like Tekken's just been growing in this really kind of like interesting way that that, that hasn't happened uh, in a long time. I think in yeah. fighting games. Okay, you were there. What was the talk of the show? What was the the big buzz? Attraction I think a, there. A lot of people were talking about Tekken and really? Smash. I think those were like the two big ones. Uh, going into the tournament because Smash had the most entrance and Tekken had the most kind of interesting narrative coming in uh, just because for a long time that game was dominated by like a couple of people. Uh, JDCR and Sane had been in the early years. Uh, these two players from Korea had just been dominating tournaments and slowly the meta had been moving away from them and, and now like the, the finals were between Arslan Ash, I think is his name, uh, from Pakistan and uh, Ni nee from Korea. And uh, Arsling, it was one one of the few finals where the winner was kind of already a given going in because Arslan had won uh, Evo Japan earlier this year, okay. and he actually managed to close the deal on Evo as well. So he's like the back to back champion at this point. He's won both of the major tournaments. Now, being at this event, um, outside of licking doorknobs or however you got sick, mm -hmm. if you can tell in your voice, uh, like, what do you do? Are you in the crowd cheering? Are you in the front row? Are you catching it here and there, but you're mainly just wandering around? What's the event actually like? Uh, I mean, it, it, it depends on the day. Like, the first two days, I'm kind of just exploring. There's, like, there are actually games to play at the show there, so I played a couple games for preview. Uh, and just kind of walking around, seeing all the setups and stuff. Like, they always have, like, a really cool uh, BYOC setup where people are just playing whatever they've brought. Like, people hooked up um, Dreamcast. Like, I don't know if you've if you've seen those games setups where it's, like, a <laughs> laptop, sort of, like, a, a portable TV monitor that you can come a PS4 to. People figure out how to hook up a Dreamcast to that, and they have these converters where you can just hook up whatever you can to them. So it's, like, an old PS1 yeah. O and E thing with the screen, except you just attach different consoles to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the and so they'll have that. They'll have things called super guns, 
which are basically arcade cabinet boards but made portable where it's just like here's literally just the board and you can hook up usb things to them and so like those are arcade perfect and uh if you hook that up to a crt monitor that's like basically an arcade setup that's amazing Um, so they have they have a lot of stuff like that there they have like artist galleries and things like that so it's it's a lot of walking around in that area looking at kind of different stuff there uh and then as the day kind of goes on you start getting into finals because they had finals uh every day of the event this year uh soul caliber was on friday and that was really exciting um but during those like during events like that i'm basically like running around taking photos yeah uh for the magazine um and then saturday was all like all finals basically with a little bit of downtime to kind of like go eat and okay. things like that and then final sunday yeah i'm basically in they have a media room where you can kind of hang on and write up stories which i was doing and then going from from the media room to uh the event center where i'm basically taking photos and then going in and talking to players because they had um they had a chance to interview like all the top eight players every time they had a f- after the final so it was yeah it's one of the busiest events that i work for sure okay. but it's all one of the most rewarding andy did you watch the smash finals i watched a a big portion of them i man and he's right i mean it's funny because like i think the viewership doubles when smash starts like really uh, i mean like smash is the the thing right there and it it was fun to watch i like watching the climb up i think when it's kind of like the pressure's on the guys who are expected to win um i don't know why i i kind of find smash a bit boring it's too much fun for you, so you get bored? I No, it's not that. I And this is personal taste. Like, I like watching it, okay? I, I prefer the more classic fighting games as a viewer. Yeah, because they're easier to wrap your mind around? It's not that. It's just, I just feel like... <sighs> it can, I think, to me, Smash, I, I generally enjoy it, but there there is a sense of, because they use the stock system, there's a chance, there are times when okay this person is has three stocks the other person has one stock they could make this comeback but it's kind of a clo- a done deal at this point and we're just kind of waiting for the match to end okay um but and they play very defensively at that yeah, point a lot of it has to do with spacing where it's like you're constantly like you know the best players can keep people out of the edge for a really long time and the best players can also continually try to get back up so there's a lot of like cycling of like okay he didn't knock them out but he's going to do it again yeah and that it, it can still be exciting but i think there there is a lot of like repetition and a little bit of uh sort of certainty in a lot of like well this person ha- this person is going to win we just need to we just need to wait for it to happen yeah i mean that said you can you can tell because you sit there and watch people like on the edge like grabbing the edge over and over and over again when you're like that dude is doomed and they pull it out and like uh-huh. get back on you're like well, that was a play right you can tell mm-hmm. like it does you can see some plays in there but i feel like the plays are are more interesting in classic fighters in sure. my in my in my view yeah yeah um, that's really fair so but I mean, the fans, you know, the fans love the Smash. I mean, the Smash is is extremely popular. I was surprised, tuning in for a little bit, that it's like, oh, it's the Pokemon Stadium stage? Is mm-hmm. there like a default stage? Or how do they handle stages in a competition like this? Uh, th- in the past, the it's game, been like, the yeah. In the past, it's been like elimination where they have like a set pool of uh, arenas that are tournament viable. And then I think they'll go like one by one and eliminate basically until one of them is... is and I'm, I'm not sure if that's the format they used for this tournament, um, but it did seem like they had slightly more uh, stages available. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of Pokemon stages. Yeah, and like Joker won this year, which was, uh, you know, that was a player play that's from Persona, which is... Yeah, yeah isn't that confusing? Kinda, I mean, yeah. I'm so used to watching what... Uh, Bayonetta? Uh, Jigglypuff Starfox, I guess. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean, like that meta's definitely changed. Joker's seen as like one of the best characters. Uh, really? Yeah, and, and MK Leo is was like the guy who was going to win it with him. Uh, but it was interesting because, like, Tweak was was the one who who made it into uh, Grand Finals from the winner side, and he was playing Pokemon Trainer, who is seen as, like, solid, but not, like, the best. It's a funky choice. Right, because, like, Ivysaur is, like, the good one of those. Squirtle is okay, and Charizard is bad. Uh, <laughs> and, like, you, but you have, like, the, the, the play is that you have to keep swapping between them. Um, and so he did a really good job, and it was like kind of impressive to see like this, like lo- slightly lower tier character make its way to winners. And then it felt like Tweak was going to beat MK Leo, and then at some point MK Leo just kind of turns it on and basically reverses. And he like, crushed him. Yeah. By the way, I mean like, it was it was not 
it was it, it got pretty close. It was like Tweak was two games and in the in like he was one game away from winning grand finals and it was like getting really close and then all of a sudden you can just see Leo basically push back all the way from that edge basically into winning the, the entire thing. Oh wow. Yeah, and, and the crowd to, lost its Yeah, mind. and he had to win like six rounds in a row to do that. Oh wow. Yeah. What were the big crowd moments? Uh there was that uh in the on day two, there was a really big crowd for Dragon Ball Fighters. Even oh, yeah. though like its registrants fell off, like the storyline of of Goichi versus Sonic Fox continued there, where they end up meet, ended up meeting in winners finals. And they were that was the main finals last year, right? Yeah, that was the second to last finals last year, and okay. then uh, Street Fighter was last last year. Right, right, right. Um, so they met up again in grand fi- in winners finals, and then in grand finals again, and there was like a very. Uh, Back, like back and forth rivalry, rivalry between these guys, and then Goichi ended up win, uh, winning on the winner's side, and you could just hear the crowd erupt. It was like ridiculous how because oh, wow. that's when everyone was gathered around. Like you slowly, the crowd makes its way from the the like more con area of Evo to towards the audience, like watching the finals. And the crowd for this was enormous, and it, it had helped that Smash was also on the other side, and they could watch both. Okay, um, but. Then after he uh, Guichi eventually wins in grand finals, he st- kind of basically breaks down and starts crying. And Sonic Fox is like the most supportive player and kind of because they they're also friends, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they yeah. kind of uh, Sonic Foxes are like hugging him and basically getting him through his win. Uh, I think it's how the Goku and Frieza saga ended. That's if right. I recall. Yeah. yeah. Frieza destroys the planet and starts crying and Goku's <laughs> like, "It's okay." What uh, are they all using DLC characters at this point? No. Uh, uh, GT Goku and Bardock is still like the two kind of like big DLC characters. You're seeing a lot of Goku again. Uh, Just base Goku? Yeah, well, Super Saiyan Goku, sorry. Okay. Um, you're seeing, I think St- Cell was in the top eight, but he's not as prominent as he used to be. Um, I think uh, Android 18 made it to top eight, which is cool for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think GT Goku was kind of the character going in that everyone was kind of... How is that? Because you wanted Kid Goku in that game Yes, so and they bad. ruined it by making it GT Goku. It's basically the it's same. It's not, though. because one of his supers turns him into Super Saiyan 4. He has the spirit bomb, which Kid oh, Goku really? should not have. Wait, there's a kid version of Super Saiyan 4? No, no, no. He t- he transforms into Super Saiyan 4. Oh, so he's like the adult yeah. Super Saiyan 4. Oh, right. that's supers. Nah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, and so he also has... Ridiculous. But he does have the power pull. He, like, he yeah, has power pull attacks. He's got everything you, you know. need, man. Yeah, he, he has, I think he has a thing where he boosts, like using his legs, firing Kamehameha from his legs, which is kind of a thing that you only see in Dragon Ball, uh, is, is Goku firing the Kamehameha from his legs. But other than, it's like, it, it's this weird like monkey's paw situation for me oh, where on. it's like, he's he's a character that I wanted to see, but not like this. Right. Yeah. Uh, they announced Janimba from yeah. the 12th Dragon Ball movie is going to be it. And I love that movie. I yeah. love Janimba. And just the fighting style looks awesome. The teleportation, just the weird evil attacks. Yeah, he's attacks. like punching into portals and then the, the arms come out the other side. Yeah, he seems really cool. And then there's, yeah. they also showed off Gogeta, which they had announced before, but... Uh, but I yeah, assumed he was in already. Right. Uh, they, I mean, they made a ton of announcements like at Evo. They, ha- they announced a new Guilty Gear. Uh, they announced another update, like a major update for Blaze Blue. Uh, they announced another rendition of Undernight, and they showed off uh, what was it? Uh, they showed off Cassandra for Soul Calibur uh, Six, which I've been playing some of. And then they they didn't show Snake. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say that's what the, the, the controversy. Hell? What was that? So during one of the match, I think it was like the top. I think it might have been winners finals, but uh, during one of the matches in top eight for Tekken, they. They had a, a codec call going at the end there, and then it cuts to. Apparently, this wasn't on the stream because when I was like taking photos, I was like, "Oh, that cool." I like I heard that, and it was like either it's some weird thing or it's a trailer, I guess. And then I saw that it was like a codec call between Harada and Snake, where it was like Snake just says like, "Oh, that was some good ass Tekken." Uh, and so I, I assumed, "Oh, wow, that's really cool. They're gonna show. They're gonna add Snake to Tekken." Yeah. Uh, and then that was it. That was like the whole thing. And in the crowd, I don't know what they were showing on stream, but in the crowd, they were like, they cut to this panning shot of like the two commentators for Tekken, uh, Rip and Tasty Steve, um, <laughs> who they like, they kind of, it was like this weird panning shot of their reaction. Cause it, so it felt like, oh, this is a major thing that they had planned of like showing off Snake yeah. at the end of this thing. Cause they, it was like an extended shot of, cause like, uh, uh, Steve is like a huge fan of like video games in general and like Metal Gear and Tekken especially. So and he was like freaking the hell out, uh, and Rip was just kind of sitting there going like, "What the hell was that?" Because that's that's what that was. like. It's Snake, right? Like it's Metal Gear. Like we didn't we didn't all just collectively we, we all we all saw that, right? <laughs> but then they ended the entire stream. I mean, and they there had was to no issue snake. an apology. 
Right. Well, hang on. Well, I don't understand. Where did they get a clip of David Hayter saying, good ass Tekken? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure. Was that, it actually David Hayter saying that? I, I, I'm not sure. Like, because they only showed it once, and it's not like it's a clip you can see at this point. <laughs> That's but so, it sounded David, like him. And then David Hayter tweeted, like, don't use you, my likeness. Yeah, don't yeah. ever talk to me or my son again. Yeah, basically. basically. Yeah. But so they so they didn't show that. And then so after the ceremony, they he got up and announced, like, hey, we're adding a season three. You know, here's uh, we're adding uh, Zafina, who's a character from Tekken Six. And and he, so he he did a thing where he would go, get on the stage, announce a thing, and then walk back off and then walk back on again. So the entire time the whole thing was clouded by when are you gonna show Snake? Yeah, of course. And it didn't happen. So people were just <laughs> like, what is what what is this? And so Evo had to like basically say, we did this without contacting anyone. We just kind of did this as a nice surprise for our own accord. We never this, assumed people would read into it. Like, right. Like, and so it, they had to apologize. Hey, this isn't, this doesn't hint towards a character reveal. We kind of did this on our own. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then David Hayter said like, yeah, please contact me if you're going to use my likeness and like, don't use it without asking permission ever. That's so weird. Uh, so it is like the weird, it was like a weird fumble, but I think most of the rest of the announcements, I think were pretty good. Yeah, including uh, what, E Honda is going to be in Street Fighter Five, which is one of those like, wait, what? It wasn't in Street yeah, Fighter they, Five already. That leaked ahead of the show, yeah. so they didn't yeah. show it during Street Fighter. They did an apology on stage, basically. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, yeah. it was kind of, it was no. kind of like. And that was a weird one too, where like Steam leaked it, didn't they? Yeah, Valve. Yeah, Valve had to take credit for that leak. I mean, that's pretty rare that something will leak out of them. I yeah. can't think of another instance. And then they but came out and like, hey, we're Street Fighter Five fans as well. We're sorry yeah. you said they go this way. It's interesting because it's like, yeah, it's a rare leak from Valve, but it's not, it, it is a common leak from Street Fighter because a lot of their stuff ends up leaking, which is kind of unfortunate because in this case, they didn't do anything wrong. It was like Valve, right? So it's yeah, just, it's, yeah. it just continues this long streak of like, uh, Street Fighter announcements. So what do you think? I really liked Mortal Kombat, which I know we haven't talked about yeah, yet. I thought yeah. Mortal Kombat was really good this year as far yeah. as like the competition. I was but, a little afraid that three out of five was going to go a little long because uh, they usually do two at best of three and, and this one is best of five. The thing that made it long was they had like a multiple intermissions in the top a eight. A lot which, of yeah, intermissions. Which, <laughs> but I think if you cut those out, I think that it actually went by pretty fast. Uh, and it, I think that game is is really strong, though, like to watch. And I think the only reason it wasn't on the final stage, I think, is because of the gore, basically. Oh, weird. Okay. Because yeah. like even before their like their presentation, they say, "Hey, warning! This game has gore in it." Like viewer discretion advised. Basically, they had uh -huh. to issue that warning. So I'm guessing that's why it was on the final stage. Um, but yeah, that was one of my favorite games to watch there for sure. How is the community taking? Because Mortal Kombat 11 has sold gangbusters this year. Or is the yep. community still big behind it? Have they kind of gotten over the microtransactions and all the BS yeah. associated with it at launch? I think because most I mean, of the I mean, is the internet ever, sorry to interrupt, ever yes. get over any no, of that of stuff? Not, but, but No, like know. the internet at large will always, like the people who, whose job at this point I think it is to, is to just like rage at everything. Uh -huh. uh, basically have kind of stepped and like kind of fallen off and moved on to the next thing. Oh, neat. Uh, so at this point, like there, there are still problems, uh, but I think most of the community has kind of said like, this is a pretty solid game uh, and we, we like it a lot. Like I think most people will say it's probably like their favorite like Mortal Kombat oh, in terms really? of competitive play. Who are the, who are the top characters these days? Uh, Cassie Cage won it, uh, which is cool, cool for me. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the second place player Dragon was playing Cetrion, who I think is, she's acknowledged to be like, good but not great and i think a lot of it is dragon is putting a lot most of that work to make her that character really good and he was partial to it because it was a game informer hot review yeah that's right he's, that's he's, right. he's, he's yeah, a big game informer fan oh i sure. see i see uh, you watched our videos that's right uh and the, uh, garris there were two garrises in top eight and he's really good just he's a he's a zoning grappler which seems like an uh, oxymoron but that's basically what he is he's someone who can grab you from really far away uh i love that i love when that pops up where like garris was such a fat nothing in that game's story mode, I feel like, but mm -hmm. I like that now he's just risen to, like, this legendary character because of the meta later on. Right. Uh, so there, yeah, so, but other than that, it felt like most char most people just played the people who, like, this is my main, this is my, this is the character I'm sticking with. I do yeah. think it was interesting, though, that it's, like, it wasn't, like, any of the classic Mortal Kombat people, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. no, no Sub-Zero yeah. type thing, you know what I mean? Which I thought was cool, yeah. and uh, Sonic Box won it, the whole thing really so, yeah. so it was it was a good moment it's he won. it was interesting to see like uh like well for one everyone thought scorpion was going to be like one of the best characters in the game like because early on it was like scorpion's unstoppable and you didn't see a single scorpion in top eight wow uh, and the other thing was that like it was funny to see sonic fox play with his regular like echo fox jacket for dragon ball but for mortal kombat x he brought out like the full fursuit and so huh. it was an interesting, like, I wonder how he chooses what to wear for those finals. It's an interesting <laughs> uh, thing. Is Sonic Fox number one fighting game celebrity at this point? He's up there for sure. Like, he, he is just a perennial, like, 
because he just does well at everything he does. Like he also entered Soul Calibur and he, I think he got like 32nd or something. Uh, and that's and that, crazy to be that good at that many fighting games. Oh, right. yeah. But it's it also very common, by the way. A lot of the guys that are very good um, are like multi. Yeah. It was, it was mm. interesting. Like a lot of those finals had like, the the people you were expecting to see, but Street Fighter Five had like no basically no one you were expecting except for like two people. Like Bon Chan who ended up winning was like kind of on a winning streak. Uh but everyone else is like everyone thought Tokido was gonna make it. Everyone thought uh Punk, who's like the best like recognized as the best American, was gonna make it. And neither of those people like it was uh, it was all people who had never made like a top eight at Evo before. Uh, and that was really cool. To, like that was really fun to watch. Of just seeing like there's going to be a new champion. It's not going to be Tokyo. It's not going to be you know like anyone you expected. Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of that stuff I think is really cool. And I think fighting games uh, in general I think are like one of the most watchable genres because it's on a simple basis. You see like there are two health bars. When this guy hits the other thing, it does this much damage, right? Except Unless smash. it's smash. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, what a mess. Uh, do you have other favorite moments, Andy, from the weekend? Um. I mean, I missed Dragon Ball. I just was out that I need to go back and watch that one. But um, I mean, I th- I think I I like I I liked probably Mortal Kombat was in okay. Tekken or, were my favorites like by far. Like, Did I, it make I, you want to go back and play the games? Um, mm, you know, not really. Okay. I, you know, I just like I, fighting games. I feel like y- you need to like commit to fighting games and and like play them all. I mean, it's one thing to like pick up the like regular like solo mode or campaign mode and play through those or whatever but i think to to be competitive you really have to to know all the characters and know what you're doing and i don't know that i'm ready for that level of commitment where i just like you know for that one weekend yeah watch and i mean i know it i mean i i know a lot of the like general rules of those games like having played them all over you know all these years so you know it's like i understand the like box traps and like stuff like that of like tekken and like just the the, the the general mechanics mm-hmm. right that that are at play so that, that's enough for me yeah for sure yeah and I think uh, as Evo goes on every year it feels like it's more and more welcoming to spectators where Dragon Ball had like a huge fall off in terms of competitors but it didn't seem like everyone was still excited to watch it like there there are still a lot of fans of of different fighting games and because you are sort of here like here's where all the fighting games are I think there's a lot of room for people to just be fans of fighting games outside of playing them yeah which I think they're leaning into like more and more every year like it's more of a con right. So um, how did how did they decide? I mean, that's the thing is, I actually assumed like when I went out Saturday, I didn't look at the schedule. I was like, ah, Dragon Ball will be on at night, like for sure, right? Mm-hmm. And it, you know, the, it wasn't. Kind of shocked me a little bit. Right. It's, it's and like, what determines, or how do they determine think, what's going to be in prime time and not in prime time? I think for a long time it was just like Street Fighter is just like going to be there no matter what. Like it's going to be the closing game. But I, I think this year, one of the other trends is that like people are just moving away from. Street Fighter in general, and sort of this going, a lot of people who came to the fighting game community from like Street Fighter 4 even, yeah. when it's like there was this huge explosion of fans, I think they've discovered like, oh, there are other games we can play, and I think a lot of it's just now determined by like raw entrant numbers. So like Smash Brothers had like 3,500 people, so that was the one that was closing in. But before, they used to be like, no matter what, no matter what, it was Street Fighter closing in. Um, and I think after that, it was like registrants. Although they usually have like, they, they I think they've opened with a, a Blaze Blue game almost every year, uh, which I was kind of expecting Undernight to take that spot this year because it felt like that was like the game the community had brought up in that that game hasn't really done super... Like, it wasn't like a huge new release or anything. It was just mm-hmm. like a game that people had been playing and, and it was also kind of growing over the years. And like, they, the Evo kind of saw that and said like, yeah, let's do that. Like, let's let's give this sort of um, underrepresented community like a huge main stage to, to work towards. So right. w- would you would you attribute there any reason why there is a shrinking Street Fighter community? Just the people looking for difference? Or is it like, is it not as competitive? Or is it not, or is the, is the, is the meta not as interesting? Or, I mean... I, it's hard to say. Like, I think the people who play it now, I think are like people who are really into it. But I think that there was like this explosion in Street Fighter V. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, Street Fighter Five still ha- kind of carries like the shadow of its like initial release being really bad, yeah. and I think a lot of people have have since then kind of viewed the game in a negative light. And since then, it it's feel it's felt like oh well, I really want I really like like this style of game. I like fighting games. I think that's really cool. But this one isn't doing it for me. Like, there's a lot of lack of defensive options. I think even the things like the top eight that I mentioned, I think a lot of people view it as, like, the narrative of this game is kind of random in a lot of ways where it's, like, it's unpredictable. Like, it's it's hard to, like, play. It's, it's hard to be consistent at it. Um, and so I think a lot of people kind of go t- to games like Mortal Kombat or other games where it feels like you have a lot more defensive options there. You, can t- you have a little bit more control over what's happening in a match. 
Um, and like it's, it's stuff like Tekken where it's just like it, it, it is so uh, such a defensive game where um, you like you saw the final match. It was yeah, a lot of yeah. like Arslan basically poking knee and saying like block this, block this, block this, and just block all the time. And the one time he pulls out an attack, he just punishes him for it. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I that's maybe part of it, but I think it's just a a, lar- a larger realization of people saying like we don't have to stick to Street Fighter. Like Street Fighter is not like the leader that it it doesn't need to always be the leader of the fighting game community. And so yeah. people are branching out to other stuff. It's such a weird time for Capcom in this streak of everybody saying, hey, good job, Capcom. They've just been nailing it on so many AAA yeah. releases. But the fighting scene for Capcom yeah. has just been dwindling for the last, what, four I, years at least? Yeah. Like, I, it's just bizarre. I do want to say like Street Fighter V, I think, is is, do, is a really good game at this point. Like okay. they've, they've done a lot to iron out a lot of the... the the systemic changes and there's a lot, a lot more content but I think at this point there were a lot of people who were expecting Street Fighter 6 instead of anything Street Fighter 5 related as the announcement there yeah um, so that's maybe like one of those things where it's like it's also kind of getting long in the tooth whereas I feel like a lot of other games are newer and more exciting um, but one thing I, do, I did want to bring up yeah. real quick was that Riot also announced that they are they, they confirmed basically that they're working on a fighting game oh that's awesome there were yeah. a lot of rumors since they hired Seth Killian and canceled yeah. his fighting project that is it just assumed then that it's going to be League of Legends characters? Because that seems like the obvious. Yeah, that, that's like the 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 one that you'd expect. But I, I personally would like them to do something new. Oh yeah, if you, that'd if be you look at if you look at the, like the fighting game space, it's like Riot is one of the few companies in a position to basically make like fighting game Overwatch, where they're like, hey, here's a new franchise, and and I think it would push them away from their sort of commitment as like putting all their eggs in the League of Legends basket. I think yeah. that, so it'd be really cool to, for them to come out with a new franchise. But if the conservative choice and like the likely choice is for it to just be a League of Legends fighting game. I think right. it, I, I just don't, there's a lot of things Riot is in my opinion. Uh-huh. And, and, and the one thing that they are not is, I, I don't think they're that brave at trying something new. Right. Uh, right. I, I, but it's I, so I, frustrating because they have the cash flow to be one of the bravest companies if they could get the rest together. I, I, I think... They could, right? And I think it's part of it's their commitment to League. And part of it, I think, is... I mean, I think, you know, the rumor is they've had tons of games that they've worked on oh, yeah. and crushed, right? That never see the light of day. That they're always trying to find the next thing and never can quite pull the trigger. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe they don't think they can put the weight behind it. They don't think it's that... You know, it has to be great, I think, for them for, to some degree at this point. So I don't know how they make a fighting game that's not a repurposing of the League of Legends character, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. But I just don't... I just don't think yeah. they'll do it. And by the way, I don't even I don't even think if this game will ever see the light of day. I still Possible, I still think that yeah. I think that's definitely in question. Ugh. Yeah, I mean it, the fact that they've announced it at this point makes it, it puts it a little bit further than some of their other projects. But we'll see. We'll I mean, no an, announced is is. Yeah, we're working it's, on it's one. Sentiment, I mean that. Right? that yeah, I mean that, that. That's that's a simple. But enough. even like, even going that far is to make it public, right? Like it feels like it's maybe a step ahead of a lot of their other. It products. puts more pressure on them to yeah. actually deliver. But I mean, like, I don't think yeah, they we'll, care. We'll yeah, yeah. I, I don't think they care. But that's, it'll be interesting to see if the, if there's like a major fighting game like that runs primarily on PC because that's what they said is like we're going to focus on the on the PC aspects, which what uh, was uh, Rising Thunder, the game that they kind of bought yep. out basically. That was supposed to be like a PC oriented fighter. Yeah. Uh, so we, like it'd be interesting to see like. The people who own Evo making a fighting game feels like it's going to be a weird, maybe conflict of interest where it's like, is this game at Evo because it's actually popular or, you know, is it just like the Evo people pushing it? So we'll, that's, that's maybe a, a bridge we'll have to cross whenever we get there. Yeah. But. What was the name? I meant to check this out. Uh, I haven't downloaded it yet. But what was that? Uh, the name of that like friendly fighting game we talked about last week? Uh, Fantasy Strike. Fantasy Strike. Are you yeah. still hot on that one? Uh, Hot's maybe a... Uh, 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 much, a bit much but like I think it, it is a game that if like you saw all this fighting game action you're like oh yeah. man I want to play fighting game. like Fantasy Strike is definitely a game that that is going to introduce those concepts in a in like a really interesting way and get you in there but I think if you know like if you watched any of the games that you want to see it's like I want to play you know Tekken right like mm-hmm. there's I don't there's not a whole lot wrong with just diving in because they had a whole sale basically for all these games oh smart um so like if you want to just pick the one you like, I think if you're having fun, I think is the most interesting is the best way to get into a fighting game. So don't necessarily worry too much about like, Oh, this is going to be too complicated because you don't have, as long as you know how to punch and kick, you're probably going to have a good time. Uh And then you can learn slowly, uh, like all the other stuff later. Yeah. 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 I have one last question. So like, like what about like, I've always been kind of shocked that like UFC or WWE is never really like, yeah, that stuff's always been kind of separate. Yeah, you know? I mean, I, I get it that it's maybe not as true like as the fighting games are as far yeah. as like they're 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 striving to hit balance, but it does seem like something that that crowd would be totally into. Like, 
just have UFC on the main stage. I mean, the games are good these days. Yeah, I, I, you know, what I mean, what, what is what is why have they not become? I think part a of lot of it is orbit. also like it's it's a nerd it's a nerd thing. You know, like uh, a lot of if you look at a lot most fighting games, they're basically like anime. Right? Yeah, like it's yeah. it's a lot of like. This has really strong ties to anime, to Japanese game design. In so a way it's that, pure. Like they want to keep, they want to keep it. I, I mean, about, I think like if the community kind of classic two v two fighting. Yeah, I think if the community, if the community were there for like one of those like EA games or like something like UFC, uh, I think they would welcome it. But it's just a matter of like I don't think the those crowds. I don't think intermingle. And I think a lot of it is like there is a larger fighting game community that is a that is a community. And I, it, it's interesting to see how it differs from like stuff like UFC or even stuff like For Honor, which feels like oh, it yeah. is a, a, in a lot of ways a fighting game and has developed a pretty strong community yeah, over the years. Point. But it, again, it is also entirely separate because it, it doesn't feel like it is in that same like spirit as something like Blaze Blue or Dragon Ball or even like Mortal Kombat was kind of welcomed in because it's like it was grandfathered in because a lot of people who like the anime games are like, yeah, I remember Mortal Kombat from when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think there is a, like a, even though they're conceptually similar, there is a lot of like thematic uh, interest there as well. Sorry, well, thank you for understanding this stuff so well. It's so nice to have somebody on staff <laughs> who can dive into all this stuff. Otherwise it's like, oh, I caught a couple minutes. It seemed fun. So thank you, sir. On behalf of your boss, Andy McNamara. Wait, what? Huh? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I think you're crazy for only watching a couple minutes. I think it's, I think it's in super engaging to watch and a lot of fun. And, yeah. and the competitors are like, I mean, they're amazingly good. Even the yeah. people who lose are like really, really, yeah. really a, good. A lot like, of, <laughs> a lot of my favorite moments in Evo is is watching like the the matches that lead into top eight because it's like that's when you see like. Oh, this guy didn't make it in. That's crazy. Like, because you see the top end, it's just a list of names, but it's like this guy beat like Daigo. He beat this other guy. He beat Takedo. Yeah. Like, seeing like the context that goes into those top eight picks is always super interesting. And a, a lot of like the the heartbreakers happen right before top eight. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, you guys ready for community emails? Yeah, let's do it. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. We have Jeff Marchiafava here hey. now. We have Joe Juba here now. Hello. We have Kyle Hilliard here now. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Podcastgameformer.com is where people send wonderful emails. Hundreds were sent this week. Ooh. We're going to choose some of our favorites, read off a lot of them, and then choose the number one absolute favorite, and then honor where that person is from by putting a pin in the big board, the big map behind us. Podcastgameformer.com. People send in trivia, questions, words of wisdom, feedback, dares, um, fun facts they learned about games or games in development. Um, Final Fantasy 3 facts? <laughs> let's find out. <laughs> Podcast again from where I come. I do love it, though, that sometimes uh, the universe is kind. Uh, and it, it, things line up. Like, Joe volunteered to do this email section very kindly. And yes. then I finished going through the emails. like, oh, there's a ton of RPG questions. And Joe's a bit of a RPG nut. There I, will, go. I will talk your ear off about that stuff. Prove it. Make people rip <laughs> off their ears. <laughs> they will fast forward through this so hard. It's, so great. Hard. it's great because I also needed a nap today. Ah, so. yes, sir. Serial uh, <laughs> wanted me to point out that uh, during Evo, when he was at Evo, he played some fighting games with some folks from the Overblood Facebook community. Mm. And so shout out to those lovely people. That's a weird brag. Yeah, he was really weird and braggy about <laughs> it. The ego on that guy. Is that an email the about it? Also, he Benjamin. came in sick today, uh, mm. and he was using that microphone. So you should really get up in there. <laughs> mm. Come Come on, just you know? rub your face in it. Why do people do that? I don't know. Don't I come into work if you're sick. Yeah. First, you're uh, gonna get other people sick. First email's a dare. Right. Joe Juba, lick that microphone like a lollipop. <laughs> there you go. Well, you gotta do it. Yeah. It's a dare. You gotta do it. <laughs> okay, uh, what do we got here? Uh, Doug from Burlington, Vermont, says, "Hey, GI, we're always talking about what games are coming down the line, but I was curious what everyone's been playing recently. What are people checking out and playing when they're not playing something for assignment?" What a simple, great question yeah. <laughs> that no one it ever is. asks. I got some weird ones. I got Resident Evil 4, which we talked about last week. Yeah, we got that. Uh, Max Payne iOS. <laughs> Whoa. Because, sure. because you're playing with the PS4 controller? Yeah, and all the Rockstar games are compatible. So I've been playing Bully and Max Payne. Is it a pain uh, in the random. ass to sync your PS4 controller with your iPhone? It's a pain in the ass to update to iOS 13 if oh. you're not already, because it becomes available publicly like in the fall, but you can sign up for a public beta right now. But you need once, that in order to get the Bluetooth sync? Yeah, but once, you've, once you're once you beyond that step, it's you hold on the PlayStation controller, you hold down the home button and the 
the uh, capture button mm -hmm. for a few seconds, and then it, your phone recognizes it. It's very easy. Got to use that button for something. Got yeah, it. that's true. Is it a, a interesting or a smart fact or, or question to say, isn't that weird that like a software update will allow you to use hardware functionality? It's Yeah, it's dumb. It's Apple just like closing the gates and being stubborn, you know? Well, they need to stop locking the gates, as some people say. Open Lock those gates. Lock the gates. Yeah. Okay, how is Max Payne? Um, I, I love that game. It's still good. Yeah. And it plays pretty well with the controller on the iPhone. So. Are you more excited for control because of it? Yeah. Like, I'm kind of like I'm playing a little Alan Wake, too. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, I'm really excited for control. For okay. Sure. And that's, that's coming that's part of it. soonish, Yeah, isn't like it? two weeks, something like Jeez, that. Jeez, that's crazy. Mm. Uh, Joe, I've heard a lot of you wandering around the office talking about Judgment. Yeah, I just finished it this week. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that came out a while ago, but th I love that game. Yeah. It's been... I have a limited experience with the Yakuza series. Like, mm -hmm. I played some of Yakuza 0, and there's some element of that that it's a little bit intimidating because it's just some... It's not just one game. It's like six games. Right, yeah, we've talked about it before, yeah. So, anyway, this I thought would would be a fun sort of standalone way to get to get a feel for it and yeah, it combines a bunch of stuff that I love. So, I really enjoyed it. How often in this game are you cackling as you're doing yakuza like moves of like throwing people through windows or throwing a bike around their head or of the house I mean, or helping perverts? Yeah, I mean <laughs> there's a lot of per well, it's pervert capturing. You're not doing a whole lot of pervert mm. assistance. Mm. You're that's helping good. perverts uh, get good. arrested. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, uh probably every fight. <laughs> really? <laughs> Pretty much every fight I'm doing some I'm smiling in some way like you know, you do some ridiculous like like roundhouse sweep followed up by some gut punch that sends them flying like 10 feet into a wall. I like, like that stuff. What's the story, and don't say it if it's a spoiler, but I hear people talking about like there's a character in the game called Ash Ketchum or something? Ash Ketchum. He's one of the perverts you're, you're apprehending. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, there's... Perfect. There's a, <laughs> there's a group of perverts that, that are plaguing... Wait, you Kam like this game? Kamurocho. You F. Uh, and they... Each of them has a different specialty. One of them is peeping. One of them is groping. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And one guy's <laughs> name is Ass Ketchum. Yeah. Dork it, of the year? It's not that interesting. <laughs> okay. Mm. <laughs> uh, the name's doing a lot of the I heavy mean, lifting. Uh, yeah. You catch him and you beat the crap out of him, and that's kind of the end of it. Yeah. I think. Let it be a message to you perverts <laughs> out there. <laughs> Is that a name on birth certificate or nickname, you think? Does it go into that? Is it a Christian right? name? Man, you're asking a lot of questions here. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Jeff, do you play games? I do. <laughs> I have been, been playing nothing but Dragon Quest Builders 2 for some mm, reason. Interesting. Can't stop. Yeah, you wrote a Funny to a Point article about it, and yep. I believe most of the screenshots in that were just of butts or so uh, you writing the word butt. Yep. Uh, okay. All custom screenshots. Uh -huh. uh, there's a club I heard that I'm supposed to join in Japan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, get down to Kamarocho yeah. or whatever else. But no, it it is just kind of the perfect mashup of Harvest Moon and Minecraft, and kind of it lets you do whatever you want, but then there's enough guidance that you can go around and create a little town, and the people move into all your buildings and use them and stuff. And yeah, it's I, just. I have a question about that game. So I started it. Uh -huh. I'm like maybe an hour in. How long until it like right. opens up and you feel like you can do cool yeah, stuff? Yeah, because people do not while. stop yes. talking. Well, it, and there's a lot of talking. And then I see like I watched uh, the challenge videos that Kyle and Cork did on our mm -hmm. site, yeah. uh, which are very good and you should also watch them. Got oh, a lot of you. emails about that, Kyle. Oh, um, and, but like some of Kyle's sucked because he just didn't have enough cool stuff to put in them. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, how long do I have to play this game before I can like... Do make the things that are cool. You gotta play a lot. Yeah. And and as I said in my column, the first three nights that I played, I fell asleep <laughs> while playing <laughs> every time because there there is a lot of conversations and it does take a while. But one of the things also I think that Kyle was having problems with though is you kind of go from one island to another, and when you go back to your main island, you're kind of resetting yeah. your progress a little in, in so like, certain it, it, ways. Like and a, so. It's like a peak in a valley. Like if you mm -hmm. pretty early on the first island, you're farming, you have a lot of stuff, and when you go to the second island, you kind of start over to a certain degree. So like in that but video... But your original island is still... It's still there. You can go back there, but like some of the tools that you were allowed to use on the first island, some of the block types, you uh, can't use on the second island. Oh, yeah. Okay. Eventually, as you play more, like everything kind of culminates on the, the, the final island where you can finally use everything, but it takes a long time. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That's very odd. Um, 
Do you think it's going to be in your top three end of the year? Uh, top three, I don't yeah. know, but it's top ten. What's higher yeah. than it right now on your game of the year list? Uh, dreams. Mm. Oh, of course. Yeah, you get yeah. that at nine five. I did. I'm going to play more of that game tonight. I'm very excited. I want to. I want to go back and play more too. You want to come over tonight? No, okay. stop. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> well, we've never done it on air. <laughs> I've worked with Jeff for nine years, and I've tried to hang out with him outside of work nine thousand times. And it I think has we happened. get along. No, yeah. hardly. Yeah, one time, eight years ago, you went to Jeff Cork's house and drank a Four loco, <laughs> and then left after 23 minutes. There have been <laughs> numerous your cars times. The the <laughs> and that's why I don't go out anymore. I'm not allowed to. The ankle bracelet doesn't let me. It's so frustrating because he loves playing board games. Like, come over to my place and play board games. Like, no, why don't you play it at the office? It's like, because yeah. I want to get out of this office every once in a while. And I want to get away from the people in this office. <laughs> He also tried to pull this move where he's like, I have, a w- I have a wife. I don't need to be social anymore. That's right. That's Joe baloney. gets it. I mean, I wasn't social before I had Wait, a wife. Wait, I realize either, this so. is the worst panel <laughs> for that complaint. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Never get out of here. Uh, I just finished last night a game called uh, Short Hike on Steam, and I absolutely love it. It's like you can finish it in under an hour and a half. It's, it's just a casual, small, delightful little game, and it sounds insane, but genuinely what this game is is it's Animal Crossing meets Breath of the Wild. You can finish it in an hour and a half? Are you sure <laughs> yes. that holds up? Oh. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like, it's one island, and it's just like, all right, you're a little bird character who's visiting your aunt, who's like a park ranger on this island, and then it's like, she's like, oh, you want cell service? Uh, you can get to the top. Uh, just got to climb to the top of the mountain, basically. And then the rest of the game is just going and exploring this mountain. You are supposed to get lost. You find items. You can do odd jobs for people. It's like a little adventure Wait, game. Is the goal of this game just to get cell service? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, yes. Perfect. But I you like don't that. think about it because I don't know if you know this, Joe, but it's all about the friends you meet along the way, right? Because it's like, oh, this person's doing a race. This person wants this item. So you're kind of doing Animal Crossing style tasks for these different animals that are living around the island. Jeff, I'm look at this. In your neglect of Ben Hansen, he has to seek out like bird friendships on know, virtual mountains. Yeah, you yeah, have the option to name characters. I've named every one of them Jeff um, And then I just try and. <laughs> this is why I don't go over that. Uh-huh. I'll never be able to leave. But it's crazy crazy how uh, Animal Crossing it is just in the presentation. It kind of has that look, but then it has a kind of a pixelated filter over it. But it's crazy because like you can go fishing and the fish shadows are like 100% Animal Crossing fish shadows. They even have a money rock where if you hit it with a shovel, it'll keep spitting out money, which is like the most specific Animal Crossing reference. Uh, but then beyond that, just the amount of freedom and openness you have. And it's so good in a Breath of the Wild style way of just being like, that looks weird. Like, why are there three rocks in a semicircle over there and then dig there, bam, you're going to find some secrets, you know? So mm. it's just like this casual adventure game. Joe is looking very skeptical of all things right no, now. No, 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 I think it sounds also, fun. Also, it's $8. Uh, it's it's genuinely one of my favorite games that I've played so far this year. I really there you go. Short Top three? Hike. It's called Short Hike. Is it com- Not tor- Top Three. Is it just PC? Is it coming anything yeah, else? Yeah, it's just on Steam right now. Um, okay. They haven't announced it for anything else yet, but I could see it mm. working on something else. Once it hits Switch like a year and a half from now, you plebeians will love it, I'm sure. But yeah, Short Hike is the name of that one. Also, it's like, I was talking to Kyle about it on Monday, um, but I'm just so excited to see games that are clearly influenced by Breath of the Wild being released. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like this one, but then obviously there's the big talker, which was Genshin Impact, which is a Chinese Mm. game that apparently people were outraged because it looks eerily like uh, like Breath copyright of the infringing close you know? right right uh, but then there's like gods and monsters coming up from ubisoft in mm-hmm. theory in what february i think is when they announced that game was coming out i don't remember something yeah next but year. like that art style certainly looks breath of the wild inspired there's another game called decay of logos it's just i love that we're in that yeah. era now where it's like yes the wheels have been in motion long enough where we're getting some good breath of the wild inspired games which yeah. is all i want for the world Anyways, um, oh, here we go. Uh, Ryan Clausen from San Diego says, Hey, Ben and the gang, greetings from California. I have a quick question. What game do you think not a lot of people have played that you would wholeheartedly recommend? For me, it would be Get Even, a psychological horror first-person semi-shooter released a few years ago by The Farm 51 and published by Bandai Namco. I forgot about Get Even completely. (laughs) Uh, Do you guys have any completely off-the-radar games you'd recommend? So these are like... Yeah. Um, um, I always talk about Iconoclasts. I don't know if that's like a widely played game, but I really love that one. That's true. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. One of them I'm... for me, and again, this is a drum that I've beaten before too, but it always makes me sad when there's a game that I really like that just gets price drop after price drop, and it's just clear no one was buying it. Yeah. The most recent mm-hmm. one of those for me was Valkyria Chronicles 4. Oh, yeah, uh, that came out. That came out, yeah, like last fall, and I loved it. It was mm-hmm. exactly what I wanted from a new Valkyria Chronicles game, and then like weeks after it's out, it's like, hey, it's $50 instead of $60. Hey, everybody, it's $40. $29.20. Who can I get to buy this uh, game? It's just like the bachelor at the bachelor auction that yeah. no one's interested in. But the, yeah. the thing that makes it so sad to me is that like, I was I was so happy to see that series come back, but mm-hmm. this entry it was sort of a referendum, I think, on the future of the series, too. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, if people buy this, we can keep making more Valkyria. And it's like, nah, I don't think they're making another one anymore. Yeah. Well, but it's that tough thing, right? Of It could have broken even. We just don't hear a word about it. And so when you don't hear anything about it from the publisher and nobody on earth has talked about it since it came out. It's like, well, I guess that and the died. price is dropping. You know, yeah. yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah. All right, I mean, we're reading the tea leaves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, let's see. Joseph from Gresham, Oregon. Uh, he says, hey, my question is, here's a weird one. What is the longest three to five minutes you have ever <laughs> experienced in a video game? I'm going to have to go with the All Gillied Up mission in Call of Duty 4. Please write in about the All Gillied Up mission to podcastgameformer.com for next week's game club on Call of Duty 4. Okay. <laughs> I think Fine. maybe the after the seven year nap in Ocarina of Time, like when you wake mm. up and you learn everything that happened and you step outside and see what the world looks like. Like that felt like it took a lifetime. For well, it's just like really impactful, and that like whole moment felt longer than it actually was. It was just like one of those narrative moments in games that I was like, "What is happening?" Like I just wasn't. Right. I wasn't like actively trying to play the game i was just sort of walking around and being like i can't believe this happened like mm-hmm. what went wrong here you know did you do you like did you cry when you played ocarina of time for the first time i don't i didn't cry but it definitely like it impacted me in a big way <laughs> come on he's not a wuss yeah <laughs> i was cool about it <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. stiff upper lip i don't know what that. in that game would make you cry i guess we're like oh the, yeah, the goddesses are coming back it was mostly it was more just like it wasn't sad or melancholy it was just like intense and like i can't believe what happened right, happened, right. You know? for me the best example of that sort of time distortion was the the ladder in metal gear solid 3 mm. which, oh yeah. yeah not in a bad way a but i mean like that's a thing where you're going up a ladder and it takes a while and it feels so much longer than it actually is the first time you're doing it to the point that the, like a song kicks in in the background <laughs> yeah you yeah know? but what the and it's the song that never ends and then it truly never ends no well, how long do you think that ladder realistically is 48 seconds well how long the song is does the whole song play? I don't, I don't think so. Song, I mean, I would say that sequence now, ugh, someone can prove me wrong, but yeah. I mean, I feel like it's 90 seconds probably. Maybe. I would be like 92 minutes. Something but like it's that. a good lesson though in just being a little bit different. That becomes a lasting moment for anybody yeah. that played oh, that for game. Sure. We'll remember that. And it's like, though, I'm sure Kojima had to argue for that. You know, it's yeah. like, trust yeah. me. I don't know if you'll get They'll this. remember this. <laughs> Do you know that whole, the Christian Shaw is a horse bit? Have yes. you ever heard about this? Yeah. It's kind of like that, where you're like, is this still going? Mm-hmm. This is, we're still doing this, right? right? And then like eventually it kind of wraps back around into like, oh, this is really interesting. I think this is cool. <laughs> you know, right, even though right, right. the 30 seconds up to that, you're like, why am I, I'm climbing a ladder? Like yeah. what's yeah, going on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's, there can be some surprising peaks and valleys in something that is <laughs> otherwise, like presentation wise, completely consistent. Yeah. 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 Joe, uh, was, oh, oh, yes, Jeff. I'm... Can I answer a question for <laughs> once, Hanson? Uh-huh, please. Uh, no, mine was um, playing through Spelunky. I, you know, I reviewed it and I liked it, but the way I always got through it was you kind of, even though it's a roguelike, there are kind of progression, like doorways that you can open to kind of get your way through it. Mm-hmm. And after I had reviewed it, I was still playing it a lot. And uh, I kind of just lucked my way through an entire playthrough from the be- the beginning to the end, which was s- still very a very hard thing to do. And that final boss battle, you know, was one of those moments where I was just shaking the entire time <laughs> oh, and my heart was beating way too hard. And, yeah. and then I had a heart attack and I died. That's really um, a shame. Are you looking forward to reviewing Splunky 2 when that comes out? When is that coming out? I think uh, they said this year, didn't they? I don't remember off the yeah. top of my head. I'd uh, review it. Okay. All right. You're going to have to do it all I'm, again. I'm still a big fan. Uh, I don't think it's lasting three to five minutes, but uh, like Final Circle and like a PUBG or Blackout, uh, that is just mm-hmm. time stopping. And I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not a big sweater, especially <laughs> when playing games. But 
I will become drenched. I could wring my shirt out after those moments. And it's just like... You know, Good thing e you're always hiding in a bathtub. <coughs> yeah, it's true, actually. It all works out. <laughs> Great point. Uh, Craig from Brandonton, Florida says, Hey, Ben and crew. I was wondering where all the Fire Emblem coverage and love is. Can we give a strategy game some love? Perhaps a late fall game club? Oh, boy, that's too big for a game club. Um, yeah, we were going to do like a Fire Emblem roundtable last week and then maybe this week. Um, but there's people out and stuff, but I think that'd still be fun to do at some point. Not quite a game club, yeah. but I assume a lot of people in the office are playing it. I mean, there are also many stories up on our site beyond the, you know, like gameplay videos, mm -hmm. things about which house you should choose. JV has a cool article up that's about like the things it gets right and wrong about teaching. Mm -hmm. Kim has a things I wish I'd known about it before I started. Yeah, I mean, but that's GameInformer.com. That's not podcast. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah, check yeah. out GameInformer.com. <laughs> Uh, search for Fire Emblem and your eyes will explode. Has uh, the people who are Guaranteed. playing in the office are, have they all picked different houses? I don't know. Because I still that was one of the things even before the game came out we were talking about doing of like just a debate among the houses. But I'm curious mm -hmm. if the, those who are playing if they've all kind of gravitated towards the same house or if we have people who have gone different directions. I think a lot yeah. of us are in the same house. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Never mind. Uh, let's see. Mitchell Fulton from Raleigh, North Carolina says, Hello, I've been playing Fire Emblem Three Houses. Oh, here we go, Craig. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> since it came out last week, and i got to say, I'm a little overwhelmed. Uh, I've only had time to play about 25 hours on one house so far. According to the internet, each house takes like 50 hours to complete. Uh, when was the last time the sheer scope of a game overwhelmed you to the point where you weren't sure if you'd get through it at all? Mm. That's mm, like every yeah. game nowadays. Days gone. Division two, both mm -hmm. of those were just like sitting at the starting oh, line, yeah. being like, Ugh, "Do I even want to jump off?" Division this cliff? two is a good know. example of that for me. Yeah, for sure. The big one for me, I mean, I had to get through it because I was reviewing it, but was uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Oh right, was one that's just like you play it for ten hours and then you're like, "Oh, I've only filled out this little corner of the map, and there's mm -hmm. this huge sea of islands out in front of me." Yeah. Oh boy. Um, yeah, it's, I'm with Kyle. It's basically every game. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kidvid says, hey there. Fun facts about Final Fantasy III. Oh, what? I've got your five facts here. Number one, it was the first game in the series to introduce the job system. Fun fact, boom. Number two. <laughs> Fun fact, boom. Hmm, it was the third installment in the Final Fantasy series. Number three, <laughs> it's commonly mistaken for Final Fantasy III on the SNES, which is actually six. That's all I got. Three fun facts. That's <laughs> what? <laughs> that was one fun fact and Those two aren't other even fun facts. Things. What about it being what about it being uh never released in the US until the uh the 3DS version or the DS remake came out? There's mm, a thing. It wasn't on fun. the Final Fantasy Origins? No, nope. because that was one and two. No. Nope. Is that what it was? The only way to play it before that was like emulation and fan mm. translation. Well don't worry. Uh, Ryan from Portland, Oregon's got your back. Hey everybody, five facts about Final Fantasy three. Here we go. Okay. It was originally called Final Fantasy VI on the Super Famicom in Japan. Oh, this The identity <laughs> of Realm's father is never explicitly stated in the game, but was confirmed by devs. It was the first appearance of Moogles in the West. It was the first recurrence of Sid in the West. It has the largest playable cast of any mainline Final Fantasy and two female main characters who trade off as the driving force of the plot. Just kidding. Here's the real answer, he says. <laughs> uh, the playable characters in the real Final Fantasy III were generic onion knights who change jobs as you progress. In the DS remake, they were given unique names, appearances, and personalities. It was the first Final Fantasy with three unique airships. Hmm. First, I wonder how many other Final Fantasies have multiple airships. Four. Four has how many? Four other ones or four airships or Final <laughs> Fantasy IV? Four. four. Final Fantasy IV has, I think, two, two airships and a spaceship and a hovercraft. Oh, wow. Okay. Hovercraft is pushing it. Your honor. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sid appears as the engineer who helps you get an airship. No surprise there. Uh, and it was the first Final Fantasy with multiple overworld maps. I didn't know that. How does that work? Do you go to a different planet in 3? What's going on in 3? I don't remember. Please write in if you understand the multiple overworld maps in Final <laughs> Fantasy 3. A podcast at GameFormer.com. Um, let's see. Dylan Northrup uh, wrote in uh, just saying that Final Fantasy XIV has one of the best JRPG stories in recent memory, and people don't give it enough credit for how good that story is in fourteen because it's an MMO. Yeah, well, and that's the thing I want to mention real quick, too. People have asked me like where our review for Shadowbringers is Yeah, because that game came out a while ago, right. and just timing-wise between, what, E3, which was earlier this summer, but still that threw a wrench in everything, 
<laughs> um, and Call of Duty cover story trip. Yeah, bottom line is uh, we've got Dan Tech playing it, and we should have a review up at some point mm-hmm. in August. <laughs> to the point where if you ever seemed grumpy on the podcast earlier in the episode talking about Modern Warfare, because he had a ticking clock because he had to go back and <laughs> <laughs> bang on some moogles or whatever the hell that was in that game. Uh, so yes, expect coverage on the podcast too in the future. Um, bang on some moogles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, Weird. here we go. Mark from Trinidad and Tobago. What is he, standing on the line? Whoa. Mm-hmm. I said, what is How he? Would we add a laugh track How would we even fact. put that on our map? I don't know. Choose one. That's the funnest name for a country, isn't it? What's more fun than Trinidad and Tobago? I said it's number one fun country name to say. I don't know. Kuala Lumpur? Oh, is that a country? That's good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um, Brazil. No. <laughs> well... Let's see. Uruguay was funny when we were young with the Simpsons. But yeah. <laughs> let's that's, see. that's not cool anymore. Yeah, I guess really. that's not cool. Uh, all right. Right in with the funniest country name. <laughs> your podcast, GameFormer.com. Uh, he says, hey, guys, long time. First time. Uh, the other day I heard Hanson mention Chrono Cross, which is one of my favorite games of all time, even though I don't particularly like turn-based RPGs. So much so that it's the only game of that genre that I've completed. I've tried Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasies, and none of them have been able to scratch that itch. So given your infinite knowledge, what game would you say comes closest, comes closest to playing like Chrono Cross? <laughs> Isn't that tricky? Doesn't Whoa. like turn-based stuff. So, hey, Mark from Trinidad and Tobago, what, what, what do you love about Chrono Cross? Like the yeah. tone, the characters, That opening theme song. It's very good. I mean, Switching they, between worlds, I guess. It might be the obvious answer, but have they played... I, mean, I know it's not. It's dissimilar, but I mean, has he played the original Chrono Trigger? Yeah, like, he wrote in. He just said, he I, did? Okay, I've tried I Chrono Trigger and didn't like it. He tried Chrono Trigger. Yeah. Okay, I missed that. Boy. Yeah, Isn't that's that tricky? Because like, there are elements there that you can get in a lot of different places, right? Like if you are really into the, into the aspect of collecting all of those different allies. There's the, like, Suikoden series yep. or something like uh, Radiata Stories on mm. PS2. Oh, that's interesting. Um, has, but, like, those don't meet other conditions, right? Like, they're not about that weird, like, dimension-hopping element. They For don't... that, you have to play Onanaki, which is coming out soon, where it does have a dimensional-hopping thing. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, there are some aspects of that of that battle system that are that I I personally really like. It's a really versatile magic system that's really cool. That Do you like the summon system where you have to have the three colors? Was it three that you have to like line up? That was so weird. You don't need to line them up. That's like a a, a way to like gain advantage. Oh, is that but, what it is? But you don't need to do it. Like for some of that stuff, man, you'd like maybe even want to check out. I mean, it doesn't get any more traditional RPG than Octopath Traveler. But there are some parts. There are some parts of that combat system and the job system there that might have some of that like flexibility that Chrono Cross has that he might like. Yeah, it's tough because it's like I don't know if he likes the retro RPG experience because the fact that he's not listing recent stuff, I don't know exactly what he's going for here. But it's like thinking of older stuff that is similar enough in tone. I think of like even like a Xenogears might scratch a little bit of that itch. There's some really weird off the wall characters in that one. Yeah, or but like there's I, I'd almost say something like Xenoblade too or uh Xenosaga. But like if you've if the, if the only RPG you've ever finished is Chrono Cross, there are mm-hmm. some like some RPGs just assume that you are very versed in the genre and like they get really complicated really fast. Yeah. So they might be hard to You know what? And this is may- maybe a weird... Radical Dreamers. <laughs> I, maybe Final Fantasy VIII? Oh, weird. Why VIII? Well, partially... So that, one's, that one is definitely an outlier in that series a little bit in terms of the way it approaches like stats and magic and even yeah. story. And like, it, like it's got a little more of a realistic approach, right? Yeah. And you look at like the fun of the characters in Chrono Cross versus VIII. Or it's like, oh boy, this cowboy has a sniper rifle. Yeah. I, again, no, like there's no perfect fit. Yeah. yeah. But I guess with like VIII has that remaster coming out later this year. Yeah, that's true. Point, that, that might be a good excuse to try out an, an older game and see if it fits. He, um, yeah, he says that he played some Final Fantasies, but unclear which ones. In that game, in Chrono Cross, uh, does Surge or anybody ever call uh, the name of the town like another? Like, oh boy, you folks here in another Termina. Mm-mm. Then you're like, hey, what the hell? No. We're the Termina. The other one's the another Termina. No, I think it's. I think that terminology is just for the players to keep to help them keep it straight. Terminology. Uh, <laughs> Kegel Yards. I wish I could say I meant I intended that. That would have been good. Yeah, you're not that clever. Sorry. Hey, look, more RPG stuff. Uh, yeah. 
his name is Kegel Yard, or her name, but now I can't stop overthinking that. Uh, hello, Game Informer podcastians and Leo. Uh, sorry, we have Emma, the intern in the booth this week. No, Leo. Hello. She's waving frantically. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> she won't stop waving. Her <laughs> arm is breaking off. Uh, this is a pretty simple question with hopefully a pretty simple answer. Which RPGs have the best leveling system and or the most rewarding system for making yourself feel stronger? Ooh. I'm a big fan of games that reward you for grinding or leveling by making you feel stronger, either by per stats, like when I was 10, or by abilities or weapons like Destiny. I'm looking for something new to play. <laughs> Oh, I immediately thought of, I think the last RPG I played where I thought like, man, every ability that I'm getting, and it's not exactly progression, but just like ability and just feeling like, good God, everything is fascinating. It's just mm -hmm. Diablo 3. I know it's like a yeah. simple classic answer at this point, but just, I love that every ability you get, it feels overpowered and like it's breaking the game. And I know that that was their messaging about it, but just, I love that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I think a game like, uh, is sort of a non-traditional answer, but like AC Odyssey is is an RPG. Mm -hmm. And that's a game that I think really handles that sense of growing power well. You know, like at a, at a certain point, your character just stops taking fall damage when you hit a certain level threshold. And that, that feels cool in addition to all of the abilities that you get along the way, which again, I think that combat system is the best that series has ever had. Mm -hmm. So, And part of that's because of the way it leans on that RPG style uh, abilities. Yeah. More classic RPG stuff is, uh, I think, like, uh, uh, I really like Xenosaga's approach to it. What uh, was the deal with that one? Which is, you have a bunch of, you have a bunch of skills that you have that you sort of chain together in different, in, in a different attack sequence, but you choose which ones you really like, which ones you want to invest in and sort of make more powerful, which new ones you want to unlock. Mm -hmm. Uh, that one's cool. I also, this doesn't make your character feel more powerful, but it's just a really clever leveling system is in Valkyrie Profile, which is, you can, it's on iOS right now. Oh, which, boy. Is, mm. is there you a, go, Kyle. A way to play it. I think it's on PSP. Oh, yeah, PSP is another That's way probably to, the best uh, way to play it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most um, recent platform. But one of the things I really like about that is that so you get a kind of point, like a, a, a kind of like currency point, that you expend to just like fix your character's personality flaws. Mm. So when so when you send them up to the war in heaven, they're like less terrible. That's fun. Yeah, I don't know. weird. That's cool. Wake up, Joe. I'm sorry. I mean, Jeff. Um, here we go, buddy. You got it. <laughs> uh, here's a question for you. Okay, Cody from Kingston, New York. Hello, Ben Hansen and crew, but specifically Jeff, I'm, I only want him to answer this question. Oh. I was watching the sports. <laughs> I was watching the sports game discussion on the most recent podcast, and it got me wondering why aren't there any new sports? <laughs> it doesn't seem like inventing a new sport is significantly different from designing a board game. So why don't we see more of them? Yeah, it is a great question, <laughs> and to his point, uh, look at Rocket League and how stupidly popular that has been. So you're saying make a real world Rocket League? Was he talking about the real world? I think he's talking about real sports. I think he's talking about well, real sports. That you know, physical sports works too. I don't. Mm -hmm. And when you when you look at the sports that we do have that we put so much time into, they are all just you can tell how old they are yeah. and and just kind of like how stupid. Like, Even football, well, like a more I, recent one, it's still like, what are you doing? Somebody oh, yeah. needs to clean. Like Blizzard could make a hell of a football <laughs> revision, mm -hmm. you know? Or I'm gonna throw this ball at you and you're gonna hit it with a stick. And then you're you're just gonna go to a base, and there's mm -hmm. there's not a I think a lot of people who play board games and are fans of board games, I have had that thought as well a lot of just like, man, like you could do some really interesting stuff in, in you know like the way that players are traded and mm -hmm. all kinds of things you could come up with interesting okay and and i think that's that's why people like those you know like the bachelor and survivor of like it's the best you you have these weird rule sets that people have to work inside and yeah. that makes it interesting but and the survivor sports just evolves don't have those and changes it and i know there's always little changes here and there right mm -hmm. but not to the point of having an exile island or something exciting <laughs> yeah. which is why the nfl needs an exile island <laughs> exactly. from survivor <laughs> I'm, now I'm curious, what do you think are the newest sports? Slam of like, ball? Of like the spectator things that people go to. I'm thinking like like roller yeah, derby? Yeah, roller derby maybe. Ultimate yeah. frisbee? Roller derby's due for a big boost, I think, with that Ubisoft game. Oh, yeah. yeah it's about to skyrocket. Oh, I didn't get to play any of that at E3. Did you I guys? think, no. I, it was, I guess we it was played good. it here. We did an NGT on it. Uh huh. Did it seem good? Uh, it was okay. Okay. I think roller <laughs> derby might be the answer. Right? 
Uh, not like counting like esports or anything like that. In terms of like physical sports, right into the pod- podcast at gameinformer.com. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. What you is the sports. newest sports. real sport that. And like the XFL doesn't count, right? Yeah. No, no, and no, not no. stuff that like you and your buddies made up in the backyard or something. Like things. Unless that... it was on ESPN or something. If that, you know. Right, right. Basketball, maybe? <laughs> I think it's, yeah, the documentary Basketball. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Sar. Uh, Boateng says, Hey, G.I., I'm glad to see Game Club make its return, and Modern Warfare is a great choice. Real talk, though. We're doing a Game Club in November for Fallen Order, no? Oh, that seems like Fallen it'd be Order. a good candidate. Oh, Star Wars? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. I'd be up for that. I'd be up for yeah. that, but we'll see how it goes. Um, Marcus Alt uh, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, whoop, whoop. he says, For those of you who, re- who have reviewed games for G.I., mm-hmm. what is the lowest score you've given a game, and what game was it? P.S. Is anything worse than Quiet Man? <laughs> Uh, What'd you give Quiet Man? I gave Quiet Man, uh, I don't remember now, a three, I think. Yeah. Sounds right. Uh, that's not the lowest score I've given. <gasps> oh. The lowest score I've given was a two to, I can't remember if it's Xbox or early Xbox 360, but it was in, uh, it was a game called Kengo Legend of the Nine. Mm-hmm. It's just like a, mm, a terrible classic. third person sword fighting game. Legend of the Two. Yeah. That uh, yeah, I, I really didn't, didn't like. That's a shame. I mean, like, it's so long ago. It was in, like, 2007. It's so long ago that I remember, like, my biggest memory of this whole review is how satisfied I was with one of, like, the lines I had to tear into the game. I was so so happy with myself because, like, at some point when you're playing a bad game, you're like, ugh, this is garbage. And then when it really infuriates you, you're like... This is even worse worse than garbage. What's <laughs> worse than garbage? Mm-hmm. So in my like straining to answer that question in the review, I said like this game isn't just trash. It's like the beige liquid that you find at the bottom of a trash Why can. Why haven't we played it on replay? This, yeah, is, to say this game is the refuse of waste. <laughs> We, okay, we got, we People gotta get put their hearts replay. and souls into that game. You know, Joe. it's true. And to be fair, I am always careful to only insult the game itself and not the people the I make of the it. Developers. If, if that makes you feel better, Joe. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, what's the low score for you guys? Uh, I looked it up, and as far as I can tell, it was a game called Kung Fu Rider. <laughs> which was a PlayStation Move game. <laughs> oh, uh, wait, are you sitting? Are you on a, like an office chair? Yes. Yeah. For some reason, you're racing downhill on an office chair, and I think the reason they chose an office chair is because there's just this expectation that it's not going to control well. Yeah. And and you're kind of doing. I guess you're beating other people up as you're going down the hill or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was like you had to use the move. It was like a move launch game. Yes, it yeah. was. I reviewed all Kyle of those. Kyle remembers for us. this game. I remember. I, I remember a few years ago trying to find it for replay. Like we need oh, to play wow. this. This is a weird one. I don't think we had it. I've had it here with these violent video games. Yeah, <laughs> I gave it a three point five. Wow. Uh, and the headline was less fun than a kung fu kick to the groin, <laughs> and <laughs> Joe fu- okayed it. So <laughs> uh, there you go. I don't think he was reviews like editor me. yet. Yeah, I may yeah. not have been reviews editor. <laughs> nah, that's possible. Uh, I always think back because it was like. You know, within the first year after I started, I just think back of you playing Mind Jack. For some reason, that's still very fun to be squares. Mind Jack. The, the headline for that one was, It's a Mind Jack, all right. <laughs> what is and that, that one got through, too. <laughs> what is Mind Jack? Was that a first person shooter? It was like a third person. I, it was third person. Minds? Yeah, you would, you would go into <laughs> enemies and then you could control them, which if was you, an interesting idea. Good. If you had to guess, who do you think published Mind Jack? Idos. I think I just said That's, it. Oh, did you? That, yeah. I missed oh, okay. it. He doesn't listen it's to the podcast. Yeah. yeah, Square Did that guy, did he try Chrono Trigger or not? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kyle. What was yours, Kyle? Um, mine was this like 2D shooter where you played as anime girls with big boobs. It was called like Odomedius Excellent, I think. Mm. It was very forgettable. And you gave it an eight. PC police. My lowest, <laughs> my lowest score, yeah. an eight. Well, everything I'm else is Nintendo, positive. so uh-huh. I just gave Picross like a seven five. Uh-huh. You read that review and you left me a lovely note at the end. I did. <laughs> I rewrote his conclusion for him. <laughs> really? What was it? I I said, and this it's, proves it's an once and for feud all between us that I think Picross 3D is better, and he thinks 2D Picross is yes. better. Uh-huh. Even though the last Picross game you played was what Mario Picross. 
No, I've played plenty of pick right, games. What's the last pick game? <laughs> <laughs> Prove it. Some generic Prove one. It. Name, name a number. Name on top Android. four Picross games. Uh, see, he thinks that he's that like he's the ultimate judge of Picross yeah. in the office. I play the yeah. most and, Picross, and he he pulled that out as as if no one else has any opinions about Picross <laughs> during our top three hundred meeting. He's uh, like, I think as you know, look, the official so judge high. of Picross. You have here. a bachelor's degree in Picross. <laughs> I have a doctorate uh, in Picross. We both yeah. studied it extensively. You were adopted into. <laughs> Picross. He was born in it. You're the Dr. Phil of Picross, Kyle. It doesn't matter. Yeah, what a great man. I assume. I don't know. I don't really follow. Ooh, you though. haven't heard the news? Oh, oh, oh boy. He's out. <laughs> He's canceled. Uh, but anyway, uh, Jeff um, wrote that changed my conclusion to say something along the lines of like 2D Picross is the best and nothing else will ever compete with it. And, and that, made it through, for, that made it, it through, Joe. That made it through. I didn't change it, you know? Okay, well. well. There we go. It's out of my hands now. <laughs> L- Luis Me from this podcast. Uh, Luis Me uh, from... Madrid, Spain says, hey, in May, I bought an Oculus Quest, and it's Congrats. an awesome device. I hope to see more coverage of its games on the site, podcast, magazine in the future, other than Vader Immortal. The point of this email is that I was going to buy a Quest from the moment it was announced, but when they announced a brand new blank, it became a total must-buy. So, Luis Me, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that name, bought an Oculus Quest for one game. What do you think that game is? Dance Central. Correct. It was wow. the new Dan Central. This franchise is the reason I bought an Xbox 360, a Kinect, and an Xbox One and a Kinect. So this franchise has become one of my personal reasons to buy any system it's released on. This made me think, what niche franchise games uh, have made you buy a new platform? By the way, I'll be at Gamescom in a couple weeks, so I hope to meet in person Brian Shea and the rest of the staff that will go to Cologne this week. Hmm. Or this, go to Cologne to this awesome show. Yeah, it's like Shea and JV and Cork. You, feel free to give them a high five if you see them out there. Yeah. Um, I love this. Dance Central. I feel like you could quiz people and a majority of gamers did not know that a new Dance Central even came out. Hmm. Although I could probably... I forwarded every email to whoever was covering news that day. I love Dance Central. I'm really? Yeah. Have oh, you yeah. played the Oculus Quest version? Uh-huh. Yeah. How is it? It's not great. It's like the worst version of Dance Central? Uh, maybe, because it only tracks your hands. But, oh. man, but it's still it, a version of Dance Central. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's, I don't want to like dismiss it. Like It's not like horrible or anything. It's just like it's, it was underwhelming, but... The weird thing about that game is mm-hmm. just dancing with a 3D person in front of you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's one oh. thing to play Dance Central, and there's, like, a character on screen that you're trying to mimic. But in Oculus Quest, like, it feels like there is a person standing there in front Don't of you, and it's weird. Uh, Jeff, I'm ass Dancing with another here. person. <laughs> <laughs> a digital person. It's, it's weird. Uh, that's weird. Yeah. Uh, okay, so weirdest game that made us buy a new platform. I bought... My PS3, because of Brutal Legend releasing. Mm. I was so excited for Brutal Legend, but then it came out. And I'm like, that's it. Like, I feel like I was delaying getting into that new generation for years. I have a real gap there. Mm. That's why I didn't play Modern Warfare mm. until the game club uh, next week. Um, and then it was like, Brutal Legend, like, you got me, Double Fine. Let's go. Yeah. And I never finished it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't like everyone else. Yeah. I didn't buy a PlayStation 1 until many, many years later when I found a copy of Mega Man X4 at a pawn shop. Because that was the era where, like, you know, you it was hard to find physical games, and that was like a tough game to find. So when I got, I finally found a copy of Mega Man X Four. Then I went and got a PlayStation One. Oh wow! Yeah, I bought my Genesis. Well, I received my Genesis for Christmas because I wanted to play Tasmania. <laughs> Hell <laughs> yeah! yeah. Talked about that before. Yeah. yeah. Good. Did you finish one. it? Yeah, I finished Tasmania in like yeah, two see, hours. That's how you do it, Hanson. And then like days later severely regretted <laughs> my choice of console <laughs> went went to funko land mm-hmm. which is where game informer started incidentally that's yeah. true and uh traded in my genesis and tasmania and i think i had the avengers game also traded those in for a super nintendo and was you know that ended up being basically my favorite system of all time so mm-hmm. that's a good choice what good was call, your guys' call. favorite looney tune when you were young is everybody taz why is taz so popular I don't know why Taz was such a thing in like the early nineties. T-shirts, yeah, especially yeah. yes. T-shirts and hats and like truck, like mud flaps. He was just everywhere. <laughs> it is odd. It's just like he was fun because he was just chaos. But he's like Same. the only Looney Tune that like doesn't have like an inherent conflict or story, right? Like every episode with Taz was just like ah, he just spins and just the- destruction. Yeah. Is that the fun thing? But you think we, like, uh, personally. And he tongue. Was, he did a lot of. Blah, 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 yeah, that's kind true. Of stuff, yeah. Oh, he sounds just like you when you're talking these days. <laughs> just all tongue and blah. 
uh, for me, I was always a fan of Roadrunner because I was like, oh, it's cool and yeah. smart and yeah. sleek, and there's like a fun dynamic there because I'm a sophisticated. Wait, young lad. you like the Roadrunner character over like Wiley e. Coyote? Correct. <laughs> I like the. Ro- I was a weird, no. like, I always had to choose the underdog, right? Like, my favorite character from Aladdin. Oh, I yeah, tried, the are, underdog, the Roadrunner the road who underdog. never loses. <laughs> <laughs> but no one else would choose that. It's like the unpopular choice. That's why I was a fan of it. Like, That's remember, not how underdogs work, though. <laughs> All right. Well, cultural underdog. He was the antagonist, I guess you could say, right? What? Between those two. Wiley e. Coyote was the protagonist, and... Hang on, hang on, stop breaking my mind. <laughs> is Wiley e. Coyote the protagonist I mean, of the you, antagonist? You follow him and you're rooting for him. Are you rooting for him? Who do you root I mean, for? I don't know. I, I think who with, do you... <laughs> with his with, <laughs> with all of the meat meeping and like tongue flicking that the Roadrunner did. Yeah, you can definitely say he was antagonizing Wiley e. Coyote. Yeah, that's true. I guess he is the antagonist. Wow. But is the coyote the good guy? Well, he's yeah. a murderer. Coyote's yeah. He's the anti-hero. You don't need to be a good guy to be a protagonist. That's true. That's that true. is true. Mm, that's a very smart uh, My game, <laughs> <laughs> idiots. <laughs> uh, I, I can't say that I bought an original <laughs> Xbox for it, but one of the launch games that I was excited for was Reckless the Yakuza Missions. Mm. Oh, weird. Which I think was basically just a showcase uh, for running around and like driving through stuff mm-hmm. and like destruction, environmental huh. destruction. And the game was not good. Yeah. It was okay. It, it worked as a tech demo. Yeah, I have yeah. honestly never was... heard of this game. Yeah. Weird. How the cover is a car it. just driving through stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. know how you can forget that. <laughs> weird, yeah. A lot of good replay candidates here, which we should mention. Uh, this week, replay is going to be live. Yeah. Uh, we're going Ooh. to a live format for replay. Oh, so it's going to be 2 o'clock central if you want to jump in and influence the chat. Uh, tell people to Wait, do your bidding. Live forever or just this week? Forever. Going Unless forward. this is a disaster and Reiner has an emotional meltdown in the middle of it, I think it'll be live forever. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, what are your concerns with that, Joe? What's your gut reaction to that? Mm. No, that sounds The fun. swears. The swears. Mm. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that swears. is interesting. Yeah. We'll what just are be we going to do? Of it. Uh, just people need to get better about saying yeah. S and F. It's don't, fine. Don't swear. Oh, that's an idea. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, a lot of feedback here. Chris Craven from Lafayette, Indiana says, the best sequel to Resident Evil 4 that isn't a Resident Evil game is obviously Evil Within. Come on, you idiots. I think we said it, but... Maybe. Yeah. Chris J. from California, Maryland says, a spiritual sequel to Resident Evil 4 to a third-person survival horror adventure game where you accompany a young woman through a dangerous rundown environment <laughs> and uh, you don't think of The Last of Us, you idiots? <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't share the name of the title so we could all try to guess oh, it. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what so, about... Did you guys mention Cold Fear? I think that's, yeah. that's what I said as yeah. a joke. Yeah. The, the one on the tanker? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The, the, or the ship? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Cade Marks, speaking of that, says, I enjoyed the tip of my joystick game on this week's podcast, but I think one of the games was given was wrong, given the clues. Rather than the last of us, I think the game being described was I Am Alive. The game also involves escorting a little girl and actually has the mechanic for threatening human enemies with en- with empty guns. Yeah. Leo, so, Leo mentioned that. Did he? Yeah. Okay. Um, but then also, yeah, some people were saying that that thing of holding up an enemy with an empty gun that was just in the Last of Us demo, but not in the shipped game? Like, there's a lot of interesting hmm. details there I forgot about. Is one of our segments called Tip of the Joystick? No, there's a subreddit that people wrote in about. It's, oh, it's called Tip the name of the Joystick. Reddit. Okay. But yeah, you better believe Matt Miller, at old perv town himself, got a good <laughs> snicker out of that one. Unbelievable, Miller. Unbelievable. Out of control. He can't be on the live show. He just no. can't. He is the sexual never, Taz yes. of the Game of Thrones. No, that's not true. <laughs> Uh, Lucas Adams from San Marcos, Texas says, Howdy gang, I wasn't super interested in Fire Emblem Three Houses leading up to release, but hearing the high praise for it piqued my interest. Doing some research on the game before picking it up, I read that it has a five-year time skip, which sounds super cool from a narrative perspective. Um, It got me thinking, what video game uses this narrative technique the best? Although minor, I love the jump between seasons after major story beats in The Last of Us. Mm. Oh, Kyle was just talking yeah, about Yeah, he was them. talking about crying during one of them. Yeah. I explicitly did not cry. Thank uh-huh. you. Uh, actually, honestly, my favorite, though, in terms of just being cool and executed really well, is Half-Life 2. Oh. There's a really amazing Half-Life 2 jump, which you see all through Gordon's perspective. So from your, you know, from your perspective, like, you just... Not time oh, it's like a, it's a sci-fi time jump? Yeah, like, you just, you're in this contraption, you jump forward in time, and, and, it, and it feels like no time has passed at all, but everyone's like, oh my god, you've been gone for five years. That's like, fun. Been, and it's awesome. Like, hmm. Half-Life 2 is really good, it turns hmm. out. I should play one of these That's days. Really yeah, yeah. Uh, Final Fantasy VI mm. oh, okay. has, has one about halfway through where it's like, the bad guy, about halfway through the game, like, actually succeeds, destroys the world, and your character is comatose for like 
a year. That's how I was trying to remember. So you wake up on a small island, but it's like that's your first time waking up is when you play again. It's not a matter of like I've been living on this island for weeks or something. Right. No, you 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 wake up and it's like, what happened to everyone? And right. Sid in that game is like, well, as far as I know, it's just us on this tiny island. Want to go catch some fish? Yeah. I'm getting sick. <laughs> and then... Like, then it's like yeah. an opera or something. So the whole second half of the Come game, on, or a lot of the second half of the game is you like going and seeing how the world has changed. The geography has changed. Mm-hmm. Characters are in different places. and yeah, That's it's, cool. Yeah. yeah. Which they did. And 15 then, kind of played with it a yeah, little bit, Yeah, I don't want to... That's a little too recent. I don't want to, yeah. like, get into that, that too much. But there's a time cool. skip in 15 also. Oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't get far enough. Yeah. I still have to play that weird iOS mobile <laughs> port to the Switch version of 15 that I bought for some reason that I've been meaning to start for a oh, while now. Oh, yeah. Remember that thing? Yeah. Pocket Edition? Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, it's... Um, we talked about a lot on the podcast. We even had the developers in to talk about just this feature but i'm not in love with the game still but that virginia game that came out like three years ago or whatever Mm. i love that like jump through time during gameplay like it Mm. was just like you're moving and then it was like bam jump forward in time bam jump forward in time like i'd never seen that be that active before and i thought that was really interesting Hmm. did you play half-life 2 <laughs> Probably. That does sound cool. Hey, Jeff, do you have an answer to this one? I don't. Great. Uh, hey, GI crew. Mark Lark here from Surprise, Arizona. See, if, if Mark <laughs> Lark was the name of a country, that's the funniest thing. Uh, for the life of me, I can't remember what issue of Game Informer it was, but in the preview section, there was a small picture and short paragraph on the then unknown Demon Souls game. The picture was of an undead enemy with a torch running around in a dark cave, and the paragraph simply described returning to the place where you died to retrieve your soul slash currency. I thought this short description and gaming mechanic was the coolest thing, and I was instantly drawn in. Unfortunately, it was an extremely early preview, and I had to wait another three to four years till the game came out. My question is, what game were you instantly excited about with only knowing very little about it? Before I answer this question, I just looked it up because it was bothering me. Kuala Lumpur is the capital of Malaysia, which is a country. There we go. So I was wrong. It's not a country. Thank you, Joe. Uh, (laughs) To this point... Uh Uh-huh. Uh... For me, it's Death Stranding. Like, but we've seen so many trailers. You've, se- we see- you've seen trailers, but like, tell me how that game plays. Tell me what you're doing. You're running from one you're location to the around. next and saying this is a barren, yeah, boring don't, landscape. You but don't even, know that for sure, though. It you know? seems very likely. I, I, I feel like there is... You cannot... If, I, if the past tells us anything, it's that like judging Kojima games by like, what you see in the trailers is a mistake. What do you think it's going to be more of than people... I don't know. I think it's going to be a lot of downtime running well, around. He, even, but let's take... Even if we go back in time and just like talk about Death Stranding from its first teaser, yeah. like I was 100% on board right. when that weird-ass trailer with like the, the oil and the babies. I was like, I don't know what this is. I Day one, whatever yeah. this is, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember there was such a weird time, and my memory might be wrong, but I recall them announcing... Final Fantasy 10, 11, and 12 at the same time. And it was really weird because they showed one image from 10, which was like that, I think it's the box art, the one of like Tita's like in the water, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, oh, that's unique. I, I forget if they said anything about 11. Maybe the fact that they might have teased it as an MMO is why I don't remember that. Then they also had like a city shot from 12, like years before it was yeah. released. And I was mm-hmm. so excited for that. I remember that shot. Do I don't you? know if it was the same. I don't know if it was like Final Fantasy 10 announcement and that shot, okay. but I definitely remember that that image of like the, it looks like looking up towards yeah it's like buildings. really tall yeah. city yeah yeah that's that's such an interesting like interstitial period in final fantasy too because like that would be coming right off of that stretch between what would have been like 97 98 99 2000 mm-hmm. 2001 where it was like a new final fantasy was just releasing every year where right. it made sense to announce several Final Fantasies at once. Yeah. Because they did the same thing with 13 and Versus 13. Mm-hmm. Like, before 12 even came out in North America, they were like, we're making 13 and Versus 13. Right. And then after that is when it completely stopped. Yeah. Like, yeah. just like, uh, maybe not. There's uh-huh. a one, a current one is there are three teaser images for Playdead's next project. Oh, yeah. And they're all fascinating and weird. Mm. And I really can't extrapolate much from what the game is going to be. I think they have said it might not be 2D, which is interesting. Really? Yeah. I don't want that. I You don't want them to try different things? Don't try. <laughs> don't ever try. <laughs> but anyway, that's one I know nothing about that I'm like. Are totally you more excited for Playdead's next game or Ueda's next game? The Team Eco Man? Probably Playdead. 
Yeah, yeah. I okay. love I'm that one as well. There's a teaser image for that. Yeah, too. exactly. They remind yeah. me of each other at this yeah. point. Yeah. Kyle, what's your favorite band? A band called Karate. So let's say that Karate's new album uh-huh. is just in a totally different genre than what they've done before. What, okay. what, what, what are they? Soft rock? It's like a kind of jazzy, acid jazz kind of stuff. Okay, okay. So let's say... <laughs> let's really get into it. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's like, at some point... I see what you're saying. You want, I see what you, you're saying. You go to a certain, like, yeah. artist or studio. It's, it's not that everything has to be the same, but, yeah. like, like you, you end up liking them because they do a particular thing well. And yeah. That's not to say that they shouldn't be able to grow as artists. They should be able to try different things, but, like, that also doesn't merit just, like blind faith in th- whatever they're doing. You next. have a good point, but I think I, the weird line that I draw is like with music, I do kind of want, you know, similar styles from bands, but like when it comes to developers and filmmakers too in particular, I am always happy to see them mm-hmm. just try something completely new. I don't know why they get that pass. Right. But yeah. like Yeah, that is weird. Yeah. Yeah, your, your mind you is pretty twisted. Point, Joe. That is interesting. Yes, I do. I'm going to give you a, a weird smile. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let's see. Gross. Joseph here from Wisconsin writes in. He says, "Hello crew." I'm a longtime Hi. GI subscriber, but after listening to your interview with PUBG's art director, Dave Kurd, I finally decided to write in. <laughs> as a Wisconsin Dells resident and someone, who, <laughs> that's why. and someone who works as an aquatic supervisor at one of the water pork park resorts in the area, I wanted to express my appreciation for Ben Hansen for using the GI platform to bring more attention to my <laughs> humble hometown. Uh, and I hope you and other GI members come to Wisconsin Dells soon. I, it's the greatest town on earth. Right behind Tokyo, Wisconsin Dells. Number two. <laughs> I was looking at your notes, and I saw that it was from Wisconsin Dells when you only said Wisconsin. I was like, oh, he's reading this because Wisconsin Dells. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And he's like, oh, I wish I would have run into it. Yeah, I was at Noah's Ark all day, man. Standing in line for hours. Sorry if you were there and I missed you. Uh, when was the last time you went to the Wisconsin Dells, Joe? Uh, I remember my last trip to Wisconsin Dells because... Uh, my wife and I were there on on a short little like vacation, and that's the day that Dan Reichert gave his two weeks notice. Oh wow! Because okay. I because I remember we were we were out doing something in Wisconsin Dells, and I got a text from him saying like, "Well, you missed a big day. Uh, I'm quitting." Oh boy! And I was like, I would have liked to. <laughs> and a bottle of champagne materialized in your hand, <laughs> yeah. and then it uh, erupted. Yeah. Very I wasn't odd. there that day either. That was like a weird thing to find out after the fact. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. that was weird. That was a weird time. Because <laughs> remember, we were like, at, yeah, it was weird. But like, we're at like a going away party thing for Dan. And then Jason's like, by the way, I'm leaving too. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just like, don't tell anybody yet. It's like, oh, yeah. weird. Well, yeah, that's a burn. Uh, they're missed dearly. Come back, Jason. Anyways, uh, this says Benjamin. <laughs> Specifically. <laughs> this is Benjamin Julius Hansen and his Court of Owls. Is that a Batman reference? I don't understand. I haven't read Court of Owls. Oh, really? But I want to, and I should. Yeah. And I'm you said you're going to bring Hush for me. Did you oh, do that? Oh, I messaged you. I donated all my comics to my local library, so if you want to read Hush, you can go to my local library and check it well, out. Well, it's in the right place. Hush? In a library? <laughs> <laughs> ah! Hush is good. I, even I've read that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I hear the movie's not great. Oh, the animated one? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. But because that's just people in our overblood group talking about it. Oh, uh, okay. A, uh, this like is a, boring. No Rotten Tomato score. This is pretty boring. <laughs> yeah, <that's> the... <laughs> okay, then Tom was like, uh, from Redmond, Washington, has a red hot question. Can I have a yay or nay on the following TV shows and whether they would make cool video game adaptations? Mm. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Ready. Should we go down the line or do it as a big group? I like group. Group? Yeah. X-Files. Yes. Nay. There was a game. No, no, come on. There were multiple games. There was a... That doesn't mean they can't make a good game, though. Mm. Yay. What do you think? When was the last... There we go. There was the Kyle's PS1 finally game. done something right. Like the PS1 X-Files game with like multiple discs, I remember. Yeah. Was there anything beyond that? Was like it was a, a PS2 game where you could do uh, autopsies. Protect and serve. Yeah. Mm. It needs to be an adventure game, right? Like, what else is that? I don't know. I haven't watched a lot of X Files. Oh, okay. Just a handful of episodes. We it's mainly about it shooting now. aliens. It's I think. Just, yeah. I think we do. Nay. 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 He okay. say. Uh, Preacher. Boy, I know nothing about Preacher. Yeah. Yay! Um, it's a comic. Thing. Nay. Is that the one where he hauls around the big cross, or is that an anime? You're thinking of Trigon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Preacher's got some interesting stuff. I'm just gonna say nay to everything because right, no one deserves fun. anything they want. Oh, Joe. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh, Joe. You'll take it back when you hear this one. Yes. Most Extreme Elimination Challenge. <laughs> MXC, would you oh, dare he's sweating. He's sweating. Oh, MXC? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's just hot in here. My hot <laughs> <seat>. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Well, there were a bunch of like wipeout games. I don't yeah, know how you do like it. like that. I, I think they were all like Connect, like early Xbox One. I mean, is, there was a Wii just, one. Too. Is it basically just Fusion Frenzy at some point? I guess so. All I want is like I don't even want it to be a game. I just want a channel on TV that plays on loop. People trying to shimmy across that wall that just punches them in the <laughs> face and nuts all the time. That's yeah. all I want. Yeah, it's fun. Have you watched Alan's Game of Games? Is there a t- wait? Hold on. Is there a ten-hour YouTube cut? Guaranteed. Of, of people it's getting pummeled be. by the crotch yes. face wall. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, I need to find that. Yeah. Don't tell people to look at another YouTube video. They're probably watching this on YouTube. Right? Well, if you're going to watch it, put another tab at the very yeah. least. Please, okay. give I us in- our dignity. I interrupted you, Kyle. Uh, just, there's that new Alan DeGeneres' game show. Is a lot of people falling off things based on her pressing buttons. Oh, Are they oh really? Are the people falling? No. no. Uh, wait, Ellen's like torturing people? Yeah, which is like not in her character, but it's really... It's fun. Well, yeah. Kyle likes when people branch out to new areas. <laughs> right. so. I like seeing her be a bad oh, person. No, for that's in her life. The human, great human suffering genre. <laughs> the great British baking show. Could that be a good game? It's just Cooking Mama, I guess. Yeah. I guess it's Cooking sure, Mama. Yeah. Should when I go back and play t- Cooking Mama? No, it's just mini games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's um, just like DS. Hey, look, you can do stuff on touchscreen. Aren't th- you having fun? There's no way that that game would capture just the sort of like innocent positivity of mm-hmm. the British of the mm, British the baking show. Like, okay, like it's not just a cooking reality show. Part of what's good about it is just how like how quaint and British it is. Yeah. yeah. What if you let someone finishes up their baking project and then it's like, oh, who can I help? And yeah. then they go and help one of the other contestants that they're competing against. Mm. What if you made it like online and people could like chat? Do you think that would make it closer to that? No, because then, <laughs> no, because you need you need all the weird British slang too. Oh, okay. Like, oh, that's a real Philip, isn't it? Hey, like, but what, what is that? What? Bob's your uncle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, he was he was he's been waiting days to use that more. He <laughs> came up to me the other day while I was working very hard. He's like, hey, you know what is just a great. A great saying, Bob's your uncle, because he was watching some video Andrew's and someone Elba's said, Bob, yes. What, what, is that, what does that mean? What it's is just, that? it's, uh, apparently it's Cockney for just like, ah, hey, you're on the right track. Like if, the, the example Idris Elba used in that is like, hey, if you're giving directions, it's like, all right, so you want to go down here and then take a right and then you're going to take a left and then you'll see uh, the big clock tower on your right and then Bob's your uncle, you got it from there. Weird. It's really a good phrase. I like it. Thank you. I didn't come up with it. <laughs> Maybe it's good when Idris, Idris Elba says it. Well, of course yeah. it's better when Idris Elba says it. Um, let's see. Uh, Antiques Roadshow. That could be a fun online game. Some sort of like online auction with more shaming. <laughs> What's better than when somebody comes in cock of the walk and <laughs> Antiques Roadshow and then <laughs> it it's is worth very garbage. Good. <laughs> did you guys ever watch, as a super off topic, did you ever watch that old Onion video series called yes. Lake oh. Dredge <laughs> Appraisal? <laughs> Lake yeah, Dredge yeah. Appraisal, because it's the same creators as Sex House, which is, a, I also think, the fantastic. best uh, comedy series ever on the internet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Lake Dredge Appraisal, yeah, it's amazing. It's just a subtle, bizarre parody of Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> where, like, my favorite is, like, when he... <laughs> The guy that's like appraising all this stuff, this guy dredged out of the same lake, this painting, this old painting, and the guy in the painting looks just like the guy that's appraising, and he just gets more and more creeped out as he keeps looking at this painting. It's very good. Oh, or then one of them is one guy just brought in a bunch of silt from the bottom of the lake, tried to get it appraised. Do you guys? Do you guys also? It's just like va- almost like gagging as he's opening this bag of rancid silt. <laughs> Do you guys also get frustrated with how funny the onion is consistently? Like it yeah. just makes me it just makes me mad sometimes. Yeah. It's just not even fair. Yeah, right? I get jealous. The onion and click hole both. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what what do you want here, Tom? Uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Queer Eye, yeah, that sounds great. Sure, it's, great. I've started watching that show. That is that is a effing delight. Uh what do you guys like for email of the week? I personally like uh, Lucas Adams here with the very simple what are you guys playing? Oh, I'm sorry, that's not Lucas Adams. Um, that's Doug from Burlington, Vermont. I, I do like that one because it's like a weird time where there's like nothing came out this week, so we're all kind of like just playing what we want to play yeah, for once in our yeah. lives. Uh, so I, I actually, yeah. I, I don't know. That. I think that one's too focused on us. Who like It's not about yeah. us. It's about recommending games. That's the point no. of the podcast. It's not saying... You know, tell me the about Jeff from's house. The Max on iOS is going to fly up the charts uh-huh. now. I say yay. I can't remember any of the other All right. letters. New sports? Well, that was a weird one. I like that one, too. I also like the time skip one for the, my three favorites. Ooh. 
I like the time skip. Time skip. Time really? Skip. Jeff them? Sure. All right, I guess. San Marcos, Texas. Congratulations for put, being put on the big board. I'm sorry for the, for whoever sent in. What are you playing? That was a good one too. Yes, but it not... was, wasn't it, Joe? Yeah. Lucas Adams, congratulations. Uh, way to go, Texas. Hey, we'll get another thing on there. That sounds great. Mm. Um, hey, for now. Oh, first of all, remember Game Club uh, coming up soon. So be sure to email into podcastgame4.com with your specific thoughts on Call of Duty 4. That should be a great time next week. Um, but as for now, uh, stay tuned for an interview with Microsoft's Matt Booty talking about how the hell Microsoft purchases new studios and the philosophy behind it. And yes, Jeff, um, his name is Booty. Thank you. Someone and, had to acknowledge and no, it. no, it does not come up in the interview. So Did stay you talk tuned. to him about Ninja? <gasps> Yes, we talk about like what happened to those other projects. They're working on four when we were there uh, for the cover story visit. He gives answers. Stay tuned for an interview with Matt Booty. Booty, booty. I was talking about the streamer. Ninja. Oh. <laughs> you were talking about Ninja Theory, weren't you? Yeah, we also talked uh, about Ninja yeah. the streamer. Okay, okay. Stay tuned for an interview so with Matt covered. Booty. <laughs> Matt Booty, welcome to the Game Former Show, sir. Hi, good morning, thanks. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. Uh, we have heard your name more and more uh, as you've risen through the ranks in the game industry, and it's one of those things where I just love to take, take this opportunity to like introduce you to view, like viewers and listeners, explain a little bit where you came from, what your current role is like. So did you start out at Midway? Yeah, I did. I came right out of uh, university and started at Midway Games in Chicago and was fortunate enough to work with people like Eugene Jarvis and Ed Boone, of course, who runs Mortal Kombat, Mark yeah. Turmel, the creator of uh, NFL Blitz and NBA Jam. So it was a great time. We were making arcade games. Uh, we were making pinball games and the factory was right there and uh, everybody was uh, off writing code and building hardware and making games. So oh, wow. it was a real fun time. And I came here to Microsoft in 2010 and started out working with Phil Spencer, worked on games for Windows Phone and Windows, and then in 2014 was part of uh, leading the acquisition of Mojang and Minecraft. And now uh, my role is I get to uh, work with and look after all of our first party studios. So it's all of the internal game efforts as part of Xbox. So you're making your job more difficult by adding more first party studios. Is that the way this works? <laughs> it's more fun. I don't know. It's uh, more <laughs> dynamic. Uh, certainly uh, not more difficult. It's a fantastic group of people that we get to work with. Uh, you know, all the studio heads uh, bring such a wealth of experience and uh, such a great variety of games and a variety of approaches to how the studios are run. Uh, you know, I really just consider myself lucky to get to work with such great people. Yeah. What, uh, who do you think you've learned the most from throughout all the phases of your career? Is there one kind of mentor figure or one person that just wowed you in the industry with how much they were able to teach you? You know, I, I think I've been lucky uh, to have some really distinct phases of my career, like different parts uh, of it. And to encounter different people along the way that really have been great mentors. I mean, early on when I was starting out, again, it was just uh, what a privilege to be able to work with people like Eugene Jarvis, really sort of the, the godfather of video games, yeah. if there was one. You know, people like Mark Turmel. Mark had a great saying that, you know, every every game is one compile away from disaster, <laughs> you know, which is kind of uh, a, a good indicator of, just how fragile uh, game design can be and just sort of how tiny little things can really impact a game positively or negatively. Um, and I uh, really learned a lot from him. You know, but then coming here to Microsoft, uh, being able to work with people like Phil and Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Ross, who runs Halo, you know, yeah. she's been here at Microsoft uh, for so long and has just had exposure to so many people in the industry that just learning from what they've seen and what they've experienced and, uh, you know, all the time they're able to say, hey, you know, I've kind of seen this play out before and maybe we ought to think about this differently. So, you know, I wouldn't say there's one person. I think it's more that I've just been fortunate to work with, uh, you know, sort of in five-year chunks, uh, a whole lot of people that uh, I've been able to learn from. Do you feel like you have a better sense of a game's trajectory, that must be one of the most difficult parts of your job, is figuring out when is a studio, when is a game, when is a project in trouble. And if your overall lesson is, 
any game is one compile away from a disaster. Do you feel like you have an internal gut reaction now? Or what are the telltale signs? Like, what are you looking for to tell this is just normal trouble development versus this is uh, a dumpster on fire? Yeah, I, it is one of the things that I love about game development. And it, it is the intersection of technology and creativity. And uh, th things will get messy in there. You know, creativity is not a neat, orderly process always, right? Um, making art, creating things that are new, innovating. I think by definition, you know, think of uh, just picture, you know, a painter in a studio. You know, it's not going to be this neat, orderly drafting table all the time, right? And so I think that what I um, can where I can add value to the teams is mostly just what I've seen and the experience that I've had mostly of seeing where things can go wrong and having a sense of that difference that you point out of where is there healthy tension and where is it sort of natural for things to be a little unorganized and messy versus where is there something systemic? Where are we missing resources? Uh, you know, where is a team kind of getting bad direction? And I, I think it really, it's not any magical crystal ball. I think it just comes down to having seen a lot of scenarios play out and having a sense of, ah, I've seen this before. Maybe we ought to pause and, and just make sure we're on the right track. When you do that pause, like what plays are in your playbook? Are you saying, all right, this seems like a good opportunity get the team together, have one huge meeting, make sure everyone's on the same page. Or what are your go-to prescriptions for these situations? Yeah, well, you know, these days, uh, I really, uh, it's the studio heads and really the executive producers and the team leads that really are, are having those meetings. I mean, if you think about uh, a game like Minecraft, which ships on, you know, two dozen platforms, um, does 21 updates a year, a game like that, there are people managing everything from the movie that we have in the works all the way to our relationship with Lego to people that deal with uh, Sony and Amazon and Nintendo. And so I think those kind of meetings that you talk about are happening, you know, once a week, once a month. Um, and it's very rare that, you know, that these days I get involved. Mostly what I try to, to do to be helpful is to really just ask you know, where are their alignment problems? I think it's my job to set what the high level goals are that what we're trying to accomplish is first party. And if something is feeling a little bit off the rails, what can I do to provide clarity about what we're trying to accomplish, um, to let the team know that they're supported and we're here to give resources. And then also sometimes just to provide a little bit of outside perspective. You know, I have the, the privilege of being, uh, allowed to get very close to the game teams, but at the same time, my role is really more about trying to stay in orbit as opposed to, you know, down there on the ground getting in the way. So do you ever, that's how we approach it. Yeah, not interfering with individual studios, but do you ever miss being down on the ground? Do you ever want to get your hands on even programming again, stuff like that? Yeah, I, I, I do miss it. Um, I kind of have a rule that I, I really try to uh, stay out of game design. I don't want to be the executive who kind of flies in like a seagull and says, you know, make this bigger, make that smaller, make this red, make that blue. And, but at the same time, it's something I really enjoy. So to sort of get it out of my system, uh, I do a lot of that at home. You know, I spend a lot of time writing my own game projects. Um, you know, I post a lot of stuff on LinkedIn about my projects. I do write a fair amount of code still. Um, I've got my own copies of Autodesk and Unity and Photoshop creatives, everything, you know, at home. And uh, I try to channel my energy that way so I don't show up at work as the uh, frustrated game designer. That's really helpful. So do you actually let people play these little game jam games that you're creating? Yeah, I, well, I, usually they're just little projects I do. I think, uh, you know, one of the things I'm working on this silly little thing right now, which is uh, one of the games I loved back in the day was Choplifter. Yeah. And I love working in the Vive and I love Unity. Uh, so I was thinking of making this little VR Choplifter thing. I've, have, I posted some stuff on Facebook about it. And up on LinkedIn, I've got, uh, I always try to just do little write-ups about the projects I do. So if, uh, if you're interested, you can go check it out more there. So that's really how I share it more. Um, and it's, again, it's really for me, a lot of times people will say, hey, well, we you know what games are you playing? What do you do at home? Uh, most of the time, uh, my Xbox is taken up by my wife, Kristen, who's a big gamer. And uh, she's the one out there kind of hogging up the console. <laughs> but uh, I will be just as likely to be, you know, up late on a Saturday night, you know, writing code in Unity as I will be uh, playing games. Would you ever consider like a, 
a rare replay style collection of just the, the <laughs> booty mega collection of little choplifter clones and stuff? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I do <laughs> joke around though with the with uh, the game teams that uh, you know if, if Phil ever gets mad at me and this doesn't work out that you know I want a, a chance at a spot on a team. You know I'll, I'll go write some code or do some art or something. You know put me to work on Halo if this job doesn't work out. Yeah. Right? I know this is an impossible question, but do you have a favorite studio to visit, a favorite first-party studio? If you had to choose just one, you can't list them all. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I would say I'm not going to just pick one. I mean, we, we are lucky to have 15 studios that we've got. I will say that what I love about uh, visiting the studios, though, is just the exposure to you know, the new thinking and sort of the new way of doing things. Like right now, for an example, uh, we were just uh, real fortunate to be over in the UK last week and we visited Ninja Theory and Rare. And one of the things that they're both working on right now is how do you create expansive, large game worlds without having to throw thousands and thousands of people at the problem? And the answer turns out to be to really try to get uh, technology in place that can be more procedural. And how do we use technology to create things that are fun and organic and are great universes to tell stories in, but can sort of build themselves. And, you know, I'm really impressed. Uh, A lot of the game teams these days are using a a tool called Houdini, which really started out in the film and visual effects world and has made its way to games. And the the things that you can do, uh, even with procedural materials and textures, like using Substance Painter. And I'm just fascinated by how these tools have made their way into game development and how the teams are using them. So for me, that's always the fun part. Uh, You know, I love seeing the people. I love the energy of what they're working on. But it's just great to see, uh, you know, how this new technology and how these this new way of thinking about things has made its way into the studios. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we visited Ninja Theory for the Hellblade cover story. And what was so fascinating about that cover story in general was just kind of what a freaky, bizarre little project Hellblade was within Ninja Theory. Because they were still, I think they were working on four projects at the time. One of them was like an early version of, of Bleeding Edge, I think. Um, yeah. Did you do you how important do you think Hellblade was to that acquisition? Do you feel like Microsoft would have been just as interested if Hellblade didn't perform the way it did? Well, I think Hellblade is uh, is a great thing to, to to point out as an example because it is uh, just a, a great example of the kind of game that we are looking for from the studios that we've acquired recently, which are, they're not going to be 90-hour AAA games, um, but what they are going to be are things that are super well-crafted that will have uh, as close to AAA production values as we get, but we're going to scope them so that they can be done well by a smaller studio. So I think, to me, the magic of Hellblade is how well it was built, um, how compelling its story was, but it is a masterful bit of design constraint and scoping so that what it does, it does really well. And it's, you know, it's not a hundred hour game, but the 10 to 15 hours gameplay that it is, is really, really well done. And so I think for us, it was more of a, uh, a test case of, Hey, if we were to acquire Ninja Theory and they were to just continue shipping games of the quality and scope of Hellblade, uh, would we consider that a success? And the answer is yes. Hmm. And I think that where that helps our strategy is when you think about something like Game Pass, where people are subscribing uh, and they really want to know that there's, hey, what's next? You know, I'm going to play this. What's coming up? Um, those kinds of games are great, and they're uh, they're things that fit perfectly in between our bigger AAA releases. So I don't know that Hellblade was the pivot point, but it certainly was a great example or test case to prove out you know, what we're looking for when we yeah. acquire a studio. So there still are those other lingering projects at Ninja Theory? Like when you acquired them, they were working on a handful and you wanted to keep working on that handful instead of compiling into one? Oh, absolutely. Uh, for example, we showed Bleeding Edge on stage at E3. Yeah. Uh, that game was in development you know, before we uh, even started the acquisition. And, uh, of course, we want them to continue. Uh, there's projects underway at Obsidian that, you know, we'll learn about in the future that uh, they've already started working on. Uh, same, you know, with many of the studios. So I think that is exactly the goal that if we were to say before, uh, let's say that, 
you know, a studio like Ninja Theory has, you know, somewhere around, I think, like 75, 80 people, um, they might have had to do some percentage of work before just to kind of keep the lights on and pay the bills, like more contract work. And I think it'd be great if we can now just take those folks and now that they don't have to worry about that, put them on, you know, more projects and more things like Hellblade. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so do you somewhere, whether it's a, a document somewhere, a whiteboard, do you have a list of just the dream big indie studios left in the industry? And whenever you're bored, you just call them up and be like, hey, Insomniac, hey, uh, Moon Studios, how are you guys doing? And just see and just ping every once in a while to see how everybody's doing? We, we, do, we do have a team that looks at that. Um, and we certainly are always kind of keeping our, uh, you know, our ears open and uh, trying to you know, think about what makes sense. It is, uh, there is the kind of the reality that we want to make sure that the studios that we acquire are uh, a healthy part of uh, Xbox game studios, you know, that we give them time to get connected. Uh, We don't want to go in and change their culture. We don't want to change how they do things, but it is our responsibility to support them to succeed. It's our responsibility to make sure that they've got the resources they need. And there is you know, there is some rhythm and some cadence to that that I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of things where we wake up one morning and we've just built an organization that's not sustainable. So, um, you know, that, that kind of gates it a little bit. But again, that said, you know, we are looking at people, you know, you brought up Moon Studios. We're super fortunate to be working with them on Ori. Um, you know, I think uh, Ori 2 is going to be fantastic. I just was looking at a recent build uh, just earlier this week. Uh, and when you think about Insomniac, um, you know, obviously just a world-class studio with the stuff that they're doing. And Spider-Man was a wonderful game. And, and I think uh, we're real fortunate to have, you know, just the relationship to be able to talk with them. So it's, uh, you know, there's a, a combination of things that have to come together. You know, is it a studio that fits what we're, what we're, what we're after right now? Um, is it a studio where in their journey, in their path, does it make sense for them to be acquired? You know, it's like we don't want to go in and to sort of be heavy handed about it, you know, all the studios that we've acquired, I think those have happened because those studios happen to be at a point in their life cycle and in their journey as they grow, that it made sense that we could enable that next step. Right. You know, I right. think about, I think about Undead Labs. Um, they did fantastic work really creating a new IP from Ground Zero with State of Decay. I think State of Decay 2 built on what they had kind of uh, initiated. And now, I think it's our responsibility to help work with them of how can we take State of Decay to the next level. And, you know, I really want that to become a franchise that we're still talking about 10 years from now. And, yeah. you know, what do we what do we need to do to make it AAA? So that, that's really more about how we think sure. about it. Do you have a fair number of polite rejections uh, when you go knocking on doors uh, to acquire studios? Have you had more than five studios say, I think we're good for now. Thank you. <laughs> You know, I, um, it, well, first of all, I just, I want to say it really is a team effort. You know, we have a, a business development group who really maintains those relationships. Uh, a guy, Noah, who works on that for us. Um, obviously, Phil, uh, as, you know, someone who's been in the industry so long, many of these conversations and many of these relationships start with doors that he's opened and relationships that he's built. So, uh, you know, I don't know that uh, we, you know, knock on a door and get the hard no, but uh, certainly, you know, there's conversations where uh, people say, actually, you know, right now, I think it makes the most sense for us to just keep what we're doing. But that's where uh, we have such great choice. You know, there's a lot of ways for content to come on to Xbox. We have our uh, global partner team that works with people like Activision and Electronic Arts. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, we have our ID at Xbox program Mm -hmm. where smaller indie developers can come in. We have first-party studios, but even within first-party studios, uh, we still have the option to publish games. So that's, for example, how things like Ori come in, right, where we are actually the publisher with Moon. So I love that we have options. So even if it's, you know, not necessarily an acquisition, uh, we still have a lot of channels that uh, can bring content for our players. Yeah, for sure. Okay, simple question for you here. It's mathematical. What cost more, Double Fine or getting Ninja on Mixer? Which one... <laughs> That's, that's way above my pay grade. Dang it. All right. All right. Uh, were there a lot of bizarre conversations with Double Fine just diving into the history of like, yeah, remember that time when we dropped Psychonauts 1? Like, does everyone just have a laugh about that these days? Or what are those internal discussions like? You know, I think it comes back to that relationship building. Um, certainly, uh, Bonnie Ross, who worked on 
uh, that with Double Fine before. And obviously, Phil, you know, they put a lot of energy into maintaining those relationships. And so I think that, uh, you know, we're fortunate that there aren't a lot of, uh, you know, any bumps and bruises left over on that one. Yeah. I will say it was a lot of fun working with Tim. Uh, Tim's a very funny, creative guy. And I think people would be a little bit surprised to find out that uh, a lot of the Double Fine deal was negotiated uh, with, with, you know, Tim and I sending pictures back and forth of, you know, what we were eating for breakfast and, <laughs> you know, like me <laughs> sending Tim a picture of like, hey, Tim, I'm having this, you know, some pancakes for breakfast. It'd be great if you and I could like have breakfast together. And he's like sending me back pictures of pop tarts with smiley faces on them and things. <laughs> so so it, uh, <laughs> it can get a little, it can get a little funny. You know, were some you, of them though are a little more serious than that. Were you making the pancakes spell out like $30 million? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I try to stick to just more basic uh, symbology, you know, smiley faces, okay. and, you know, game-related stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess that works. So if a studio like Double Fine wanted to keep releasing multi-platform, I know Psychonauts 2 is still coming to other uh, systems out there, but if they were interested in staying multi-platform moving into the future, even though they're a Microsoft studio, would you allow such a thing? Yeah, I think we would. I think that the question is less binary about... Should it be on Switch? Should it be on PlayStation? And more, does it make sense for the franchise? In other words, is it a kind of game where it would benefit from the network effect of being on a bunch of different platforms? Or is it a game where we can best support it by putting resources and making sure that our platforms, things like xCloud and Game Pass and Xbox Live are really leaning in to support the game. Um, and so with something like Minecraft, I think it was a, a no-brainer that we were never going to try to take anything away from players that existed on those platforms. And certainly we've added new platforms since that acquisition. But then, uh, you know, obviously we're going to have our big franchises like Forza and Halo and Sea of Thieves, where those games are designed from the outset to really exist on uh, Xbox. And I think that will continue. Yeah. So something like for Outer Worlds, I'd imagine you're planning an Outer Worlds 2 being like a big Microsoft exclusive moving into the future as well then? Yeah, I think that'd be that kind of game. And I, I, uh, I, you know, from what we've seen of Outer Worlds, you know, my hope is that that's something that we can build and that it really becomes, uh, you know, an enduring franchise and it really starts to grow and that we can help expand that. I think it's a great universe they've created. You know, I think about what are the things that you need uh, for a franchise to kind of bear weight? You know, like what can it, what can it withstand? And, you know, can it, uh, is it a narrative? Is it a set of characters? Is it a universe that's big enough that you could start to add on to it? And that's what I love about what the, you know, Halo has created. Yeah. Uh, it can support, you know, all kinds of novels and fiction and comic books. Um, you know, I think State of Decay is on its way to getting there in terms of a, a world and a fiction and a set of narrative rules that could be built on. And Outer Worlds, I hope, also gets that kind of traction. It'll yeah, be great definitely. to see it, uh, see it get out there and get played. Do any studios bring up the idea of pulling a bungee or a twisted pixel and like buying themselves back and getting out of the Microsoft bubble? That was such a weird duality in your history. Is that ever mentioned these days? Um, you know, I actually, I, the, it's, I'll, I'll focus on the twisted pixel one because that is one uh, that I actually led that acquisition and I'm still, you know, real good friends with Josh Bear and Bill and the guys down at Twisted Pixel. Uh, I, I was, um, you know, when things don't work out exactly the way you want, you always have to pause and ask yourself what there is to learn. But we put energy into structuring the deals so that if something like that doesn't work out, we have the ability to sort of put it back without it putting it back broken or damaged, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I love the fact that Twisted Pixel still exists, that they've found a lot of success doing the VR work that they've done. You know, they've done a lot of cool games with Oculus. And... It was important to me when our strategy kind of took a right turn from where it was when we decided to acquire Twisted Pixel that we were able to unwind that without kind of leaving just uh, you know debris behind, right? And that isn't to say that we have any intention of divesting of studios. It's not what we want to do, yeah. but it's just more, it's important to me that we leave things in better shape than they were when we found them, you know, kind of put it back better than how you found it. And, you, you know, just because you brought up Twisted Pixel, I think that was an example of where we were yeah. able to do that. Yeah, for sure. It's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, okay, not looking for new details on Halo Infinite gameplay, anything like that. 
but can you share like a reaction you've had seeing maybe your biggest demo of that game? Is there just a surprise that you had internally just like, oh, this game is more blank than I expected? Yeah, I, um, it is, uh, it is a great part of my job to be able to just work with that team and get to get previews of things. Um, I think the, the, the first thing that, uh, is just very cool and where that game is headed is how they're thinking about expanding the world, right? I won't go so far as to say sandbox because you bring up sandbox and people sort of overload that term with a lot of other things, but what the team is doing to build a bigger universe and a bigger set of gameplay scenarios and just more things to explore um, is awesome. And it's just like the things they're working on are really cool. The second thing is just um, as they bring the Slipspace engine up to date with where we're at in terms of uh, you know graphics these days, there's just uh, some cool stuff design-wise. Uh, it's been really cool to see them get back to some of the the shape language and design language of some of the earlier Halos. You know, there could be said that uh, Halo, when you get into Halo 5, maybe it was getting a little busy design-wise, and it's cool to just see them. It feels, uh, at once, it feels more modern and more clean, but also I think there are stronger echoes back to the roots of Halo, and it, it's really cool to see that stuff. So the answer to the blank question would be cleaner and bigger? Is that a fair... <laughs> Boiling down if you had to boil that? it down, I, I would actually say uh, visually impressive and more expansive. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, hey, pop quiz, I don't know if you know this. Uh, you guys own Perfect Dark. Are, are you aware of this? <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> on, on my list that I also keep is also a, a list of IP. It's right up there, a list of studios we'd like to talk to. <laughs> so I, I am aware of that, yeah. That's got to be so much fun. How often do you get approached by studios, you know, India, whether they're owned, just begging to work on a franchise that you guys own? Because especially with these studio acquisitions, you guys own a lot of IP at this point. Yeah, you know, I, I, a story that I love related to that is how we ended up deciding to go take a run at Battletoads. Yeah. And the, the, the Battletoads thing, this is the part that I love about it. Um, we are mature enough as a game industry that we now have people who are starting out in their career who grew up playing a certain IP or a certain game and are now working in the industry. And they have a particular take on where they would like to go with it or what they would like to do. So the way Battletoads actually came about was uh, some of the people that are involved working on it actually approached Craig Duncan, who's the studio head at Rare, saying, hey, we remember growing up with this game. We would love to take a run at putting our twist on this IP. And then Craig and I had a conversation, said, yeah, this is great. We love the energy. We'd love to see what they do. You know, there's some things we want to do to make sure that they stay in bounds and, you know, don't sort of break uh, some of the guidelines of the IP. But that kind of thing I love, you know, and yeah. uh, it's sort of how we ended up. Uh, it's been a few years now, but um, when I was fortunate enough to be working with the team when we rebooted Killer Instinct, yeah. you know, that really came about because there was just an energy and a passion for it. And those are the scenarios that I love. And I think that those tend to work out a little better than kind of trolling through a spreadsheet, you know, ah, hey, this, you know, you know, nobody's done this in a while. Maybe we could reboot that one. Yeah. Um, I think if there's somebody that has a personal passion for it, it really can work out. So what is the name of the studio that is making Battletoads then? Um, it's Dalala is Dalala. the is the group that's working with Rare. And it's uh it's a real close partnership. Um, in terms of how they're working, both uh, with input on you know what's true to the IP and what are some things we'd like to do, and then like I said, the group working on it is really bringing a lot of great energy. Yeah, uh, this might be above your pay grade as well, but do you know where the name Scarlet came from? Were you in that brainstorming session to come up with just the name Scarlet for next gen? Yeah, there is uh, somewhere there is a whole set of guidelines on how we come up with code names. And, you know, you've got to make sure that somebody else in the company is not using it. And they've got to be, uh, you know, there there's some rules about how generic they are. So somewhere there was a meeting to pick that code name, but, but I, I was it. not in it. <laughs> do you right now, not revealing what it is, do you know the name of the next gen Xbox? I've seen pictures. <laughs> with a name in there. <laughs> I've seen, I, I have a sense of what it's going to look like. And actually, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is done by our great partners and our marketing team. Yeah. Uh, and it is something that, you know, we, 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 we sort of find out along the way just as the play 
Stu. Okay, that's hey, fine. Hey, Ben, you have time for one more question. Okay, great. Uh, here's a weird one. Um, just talking about xCloud and the future of xCloud. Have you guys talked internally, maybe this is a no-brainer or it's a no way in hell, about just making like an xCloud app for the 360? Like, is that technically possible to be able to play next-gen games on your 360? You know, that's an interesting one. I don't, uh, we'd have to have, we'd have to have somebody uh, that knows way in more on whether it's possible, but I love the line of thinking because what you bring up is exactly the thinking of what the goal is for xCloud, which is, hey, we have this library of content. I think right now, um, don't quote me on this, but there are over a thousand games currently in development for Xbox. And so when you think, and that's just new stuff that hasn't come out yet. Um, and then you've got the incredible back catalog that we have, plus you've got all the stuff that we're working on right now. What an amazing library of content. How do we surface that content to people on different devices? So how do we bring xCloud to an Android phone like we were demoing at E3? Yeah. You know, how do we make xCloud available on tablets and uh, small laptops? And so for you to throw out, hey, what about on 360? Like if it would you know, if we could get that to run the same as we get it to run on a phone, I think it's a great idea, right? Um, and in the spirit of what you're asking, I think is exactly aligned with what we're trying to accomplish with xCloud, which is to surface our library of content to a broader range of devices. Yeah, got it. Well, hey, Matt Booty, thank you so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's been a good talk. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to send me any files of any games you're working on. We're, we're <laughs> happy to review them at Game Informer and get you a score privately, even if you're interested. <laughs> Don't listen to him, that. Matt. Don't listen to him, Matt. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> All right, cool. And thank you so much for watching and listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show podcast. Be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. If you make a bet early in the podcast and you lose, <clears throat> like for the rest of the podcast, you have to stand up and hold the microphone. It's funny. Watch him fall on the ground. Joe, do you know what this music is? Oh, there we go. It worked.